Well, everyone, welcome to the Joint Research Group and Web of Things, uh, Web of Things meet, meeting. This originally planned to happen in Helsinki, um, but of course, obviously, due to the recent recent changes, uh, now we're also having this meeting online. And I hope you right now. Well, uh, as you mentioned at the beginning, uh, we are recording this session. Uh, also, as a, as a general policy, uh, in terms of RT meetings, remember to be nice to each other, accommodating and professional. And also, the IPR guidelines of the IEPF do apply on this meeting. For more of the, the chair's laws of the privacy code and conduct and IPR policy. A few well, words about the goals of IPR. Can you press mute all? Moment. Thank you. All right. Everyone should be muted. So please uh, keep yourself muted unless you are talking, then we'll avoid the background noise. Okay. Thank you. So let's go to you. So, IRPF meeting, research platform meeting. And here we are focusing on the long-term research issues of, of the internet. So we are not doing standards development, although we do have post collaboration with the IETF where there is a lot of standards development happening. And we do publish occasional information on experimental documents. But the key goal is this exploration and research of IoT. A quick administrative uh, We do have notes. Uh, there's a link in the chat. There's also the first link on the slide. Uh, please go over in the, into the meeting minutes as a beginning as a uh, the mailing list if you are uh, aware of, of meetings and, and other information. About things in RG, we highly recommend you to join. You will get invited to these kind of meetings and everything else related. We also do have a GitHub repository, uh, as we do have for things in RG meetings. There you can find the latest information, agenda slides, and other relevant materials. Um, we're going to do gonna collaborative do note taking. Uh, we're going to do collaborative note taking, so if, feel free to uh, chime in the notes. I will be taking some notes there, but uh, anyone is feel free to add whatever has been missed. But uh, we're planning to experiment with slightly different notes than usual, not doing full transcribe, but rather put the key key discussion items and a timestamp on the notes, so then we can refer to the recording for more, more detailed aspects whenever needed. So you will be seeing some timestamps on uh, that referred to when was that discussion uh, started. We will try and this is a three hour meeting. Uh, we'll try and in halfway have a roughly, roughly 20 minutes break. We are running from 12 Zoom. Uh, so apologies for everyone in, in, in the West Coast, but it's pretty much the only way for us to accommodate both US, Europe, and, and Asia in a somewhat reasonable time frame. But we do have meetings in different time time times to accommodate for, for different people. Words about the Internet Research Group, Scope and Goals. So we are a, a research group and for the key issue we're focusing on is turning the real IoT in, into reality. Quite a bit focused on the constraint nodes and how they can talk among themselves uh, with the wider internet. But in particular, we are focusing here on, on aspects that have standardization opportunities at the IETF side. So starting at the IP adaptation layer, working up all the way up to applications, management, APIs, and of course not including, uh, not forgetting <laughs> security. And at the RG, we do a lot of collaboration with the IETF groups. For example, Core and, and Elvik are two groups we have close collaboration with. So there's a lot of intentional overlap in the work and often, oftentimes documents starting from one group and moving to others and documents being uh, built and, and drafted together. 
also in the RG, we have this activity called uh, Wishy, and um, this is a slide actually we showed uh, in our previous uh, joint meeting with w 3 Web of Things, um, where we have a lot, lot of overlap in, of interest, in particular in this meeting on the modeling of data interactions for IoT and also RESTPAID hypermedia for IoT. But there's a set of other topics also what we have in the Wishy activity, so if you are interested in, in working together on those topics, we welcome you to join our, our Wishy meetings. few words about our history with the W3C Web of Things. Um, so one of the goals of Thinking RG is this facilitation of coordination and collaboration between the IETF IRTF groups and other IoT related organizations. So we have been closely in collaboration with the W3C Web of Things uh, pretty much from the beginning of, of, of both of the groups. So we have had sort of face-to-face -face and online meetings. We're doing technology development and exploration together. We are building tools together, having common hackathons, etc. So this meeting is a, a continuation of, of a, a long of a many set of meetings uh, that we have on these common topics. So that was the intro part to the background of this whole meeting series, and here's the agenda for today. Um, and Michael McCool, um, co-chair of the Web of Things group, would you like to to get the overview of the agenda? Yeah, maybe we can use the agenda uh, on the web page because it's more up to date now. This one's a little out of date. Uh, anyways, let me share my screen. And so the first thing here is just do an update on the other things. First of all, can people hear me okay? Yes. Okay, good. All right, let me just share. Um, so there's a link to this presentation if you want to look at it later on. Um, and let me just try and get this going. Right. So, um, so I, so yeah, so the uh, Web of Things uh, is a working group and an interest group within W3C. The interest group is an exploratory group um, uh, and the working group actually develops standards. They were both recently rechartered, um, and actually the interest group was rechartered in November, and the working group was just rechartered in, actually in April. We actually started the process much earlier, but because of various delays, uh, we had to delay it. However, we're both now rechartered for another two years, and there's a number of new um, work items on the table for the second round. Now, the previous round we just finished, we did publish uh, two, two uh, W3C recommendations that I will summarize briefly in a minute. But, uh, and then I'll also talk about the new work items uh, and what we're now working on. Now, the general goal is to adapt web technologies to IoT, uh, but that covers a lot of territory. Another goal is to not repeat things that are done elsewhere. And so we're trying to find appropriate gaps to fill and to enable interoperability. And we're, we're looking at basically the application layer um, and not at the protocol layer. Okay, so we're trying to work above the layer of protocols. In fact, one of the goals is to allow, you know, cross protocol adaptation and allow a single, you know, uniform application layer to map many different protocols. So the diagram below is meant to invoke this idea of a narrow waste, that we have a single abstraction that acts as a narrow waste between the application layer and all the various protocols. One of the key strategies here is a descriptive approach where we describe how uh, systems work so that the adaptation layer can use that description rather than using a prescriptive approach where we try to tell people how to do things. We recognize there's already a lot of things out there. There's a lot of brownfield devices. There's a lot of competing ecosystems. And so rather than you know, playing the game and trying to get everyone to switch over to our system in, in a prescriptive approach, instead we're going to describe things uh, that already exist and try and integrate with them. Now, I'm gonna talk a bit later on in this meeting about discovery. Um, that's one of the themes of this workshop, and uh, I want to uh, overview where we, where we are with that right now. And this basically boils down to, if we're doing a descriptive approach, how does somebody find the description? Um, and I think this is a key component to actually make the system work. Right, let me first describe what we have accomplished. 
So we recently published two specifications, uh, the Watt architecture and the Watt thing description. What architecture basically describes the high level constraints, uh, the use cases actually, which Michael Legali will be talking about our, our recent work on uh, for the next round, and also an abstraction. So we have an abstraction at the application layer that is basically, you know, describes the affordances that a device can do without, and then we also have a protocol binding which describes uh, basically how to map the high level abstraction down to, you know, the actual protocol layer. But the idea is that the mapping to the protocol layer is done automatically by the system and the user, uh, the application uh, writer, only needs to worry about the high level abstraction. Now, the Watt thing description um, is a JSON LD 1.1 file that embodies the description of uh, a given device or thing. And this is just a short little brief snippet uh, to show you the general idea. So there is, because it's a JSON LD file, there's a, a context file that defines basically um, links for all the terms. So we can use RDF um, uh, as uh, information models. However, we've avoided a, a dependency on RDF. So you can also treat the, the thing description as a plain old JSON file and just read it that way. So you can do semantic processing if you wish, but you don't have to. And especially for small devices, you don't have to. If you're just producing or consuming a TD, you don't need to deal with the JSON LD uh, for a lot of use cases. Now, the connection, however, with uh, uh, RDF is that semantic tagging and annotation can be added to thing descriptions. And this is where we believe there's a connection between activities like the one data model. Um, but other than that, you basically have uh, properties, events, and actions as being um, the main affordances and how that got lo that lost here. But um, and then for each of a property, event, and action, you can have uh, data models for the interactions. And the data models are done with basically a uh, uh, JSON schema style syntax, but which also applies other play payloads besides JSON. Um, this is our overview diagram for our use cases. And so thing descriptions can apply to a lot of different use cases. They can obviously apply to like, you know, uh, looking at existing devices in a local network. They could also apply to things like proxies where you need to, uh, you know, bring data uh, into the cloud, let's say. Um, it can also apply to things like uh, digital twins in the cloud that, uh, or, or databases in the cloud that need to ingest data from a device. Um, and also uh, uh, gateways and, and synchronization. So you might have to uh, hold data for offline devices and create like a, 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 a shadow uh, of them. So uh, we are now in the midst, and Michael Agali will speak to this, of reviewing our use cases and our requirements and doing a lot more work to dig into uh, detailed use cases and extracting requirements. So I will let Michael uh, talk to that, uh, just to mention that uh, the applicability of thing description is actually quite broad, and this is kind of good news, bad news. Um, so we are trying to narrow down uh, precise uh, use cases so we can get our requirements nailed down. A good example of requirements we need to look at are security. What exact security uh, schemes and protocols do we have to support? What exact actually communication protocols do we have to support, and so forth. Um, another thing that uh, the Web of Things enables is orchestration. We currently have two systems that have been built that are available um, to do orchestration. Others are, of course, possible, but there is a scripting API document that's been written and has been specified. It is currently an informative document, and there's an implementation of it called Node Watt, uh, which is uh, on uh, on ThingWeb, and uh, this is a uh, Linux Foundation project, I believe. Um, no, Eclipse. And um, so you can get an implementation of this. It runs inside node.js. It's actually um, a, a TypeScript implementation, so it's also strongly typed. And, and this follows the specification that is being written as an informative document. Um, there's also uh, visual language support. So there's a system called NodeGen that can take um, a thing description and generate nodes in Node-RED 
So you can drag and drop uh, to talk to devices described by thing descriptions. And the basic benefit here is you can, if you have metadata, you can automatically populate a node red uh, you know, dashboard to be able to select devices. And this is actually uh, something we're looking at for our retail use case, as I'll mention in the POC discussion. Um, right. Okay, so let me talk about the new work items. And so at a very high level, um, you can see there's a bunch of different things we're doing. Now, some of these, um, most of those in the first column are really just maintenance uh, uh, operations. So things we have to just fix. Um, and so a good example of this would be, you know, default for observe. You know, right now we have, you know, some protocols have an observe interaction, but it's not clear on, say, for example, HTTP, um, what, what the default is, if you mention which one you're using, because there's six different ways to do it, or not that many, but. So, um, so just to make it easier to write a TD, we like to define some defaults for some of these. That's a simple example. Another thing that'd be useful is we have links, but we don't have defined relational types for various applications. For example, I might want to link between a TD and a, a template for that TD. So a template applies to a class of devices, uh, a, thing, a TD applies to a particular device, an instance. So it'd be nice to have a, a standardized relational type for, for that uh, to connect a TD to its TD template. Um, that's just one example. There's lots of different relationships you might have to define between things. There's already, already INA types, for lots of link relations. So the issue here is just, can we, can we pick a particular relational type and, and give it a precise definition in our, in our use case? Um, in the middle column is more um, complicated things we need to do. Um, and so one of these is profiles. So one of the problems with a descriptive mechanism is it can, it's open-ended, so it can conceptually describe all kinds of new things that may not exist when the spec is defined. So that's great. The problem is when an implementer comes along and needs to implement something, and they wanna know that it works out of the box, they wanna know, uh, they wanna have a finite set of things they need to implement. So we need to state, you know, what are the finite set of things that an implementation has to support in order to get out of the box interoperability. And so the approach we're taking here is to look at profiles. This is still ongoing work. Uh, we're still discussing precisely what needs to be in a profile. Um, so there's also, besides like, you know, uh, protocols that are supported or not, or schemes, security schemes are supported or not. It's also things like how should we have limits on string lengths for you know, finite devices and so forth. Um, this also relates actually to the topic I'll talk about later on for discovery. Um, uh, if TDs are unbounded in length, it makes uh, uh, protocol for discovery uh, tricky. Um, and then I mentioned templates already. Um, this uh, concept needs to be refined. It turns out there's multiple use cases for templates and we have to figure out uh, what the requirements are and make sure that the template satisfies. For example, should security schemes be in a template? Should there be a URI template for forms, etc.? How do you know what protocol a thing is going to use from the template if a form is not included? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, complex interactions that we were talking about today, and this is basically the idea of using hypermedia uh, controls for things like actions and events. Also, we talked about discovery today, which is basically how do you get a thing description. Uh, other topics, which we won't get into, um, identifiers. We're actually been looking at decentralized identifiers as one option here, but there's also the issue of things like rotating identifiers. What if I have a thing in a, in a directory and the identifier changes? I want to rotate it. Um, how do I notify people, etc. Security schemes, we, uh, we've been talking about, about OAuth lately um, and other possible schemes. And we need to figure out uh, what schemes we need and what the use cases are. And yes, and also I guess there's been a lot of work lately on MQTT under protocol vocabulary. And generally speaking, new protocols are being considered. Okay, so as I said, I'll be talking, we talked about a bunch of these things today uh, in particular the complex interactions and discovery, and also the use cases. 
Um, anybody have any questions or, or, or uh, uh, comments at this point? Okay. Anyways, I just want to point out this slide, a bunch of links. If you want to follow up on reading. Yeah. Maybe, maybe uh -huh. a quick comment on, on, the, on the Q control. Um, so since we are not a, a massive group, um, whenever, if there's a natural pause uh, to ask questions, go, go ahead and, and, and chime in. Uh, if there's more discussion ongoing, uh, you can always put a Q plus uh, into the chat of the WebEx and then we'll be picking up people from there. But both options are available for you to on questions and comments. Thanks. I think anything worth so Raise saying. hands in WebEx. Uh, yeah, that would work too. I, I should also mention at this point, uh, please review the uh, uh, agenda. Agen oh, Trying to exit here. Uh, people should also check their on this list uh, for the attendees. So we make sure we got we capture everybody. Take take a moment to review that. Some of the people logged in didn't use their real name in the WebEx, so it's hard for us to know what to put here. I think that was Ken's been captured. That's good. Okay. Um. Anyways, I think we should go on the next item. On the agenda. Okay. Thank you, Michael. I guess the next one is the use case process and overview by Michael Lagali. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Sharing my slides, so I just uploaded them on a branch on a fork and will create an MR after I presented them. Um, I'm going to talk about the use cases and uh, I have I have a combined presentation, so I have a couple of uh, topics that I want to talk about. One is uh, use cases, then I have life cycles. The life cycle, the state where we are, and then I can quickly outline what we are doing with profiles. Um, Michael already introduced the topic when he gave the entire overview about uh, Web of Things work items in this charter period, and I have a little bit more details on that one. I'm um, the editor, co editor of the Architecture Task Force, I'm driving the work there. And we have quite a lot of things on our plate. Let me just increase mine. Okay. I just got a crash report from PowerPoint. Sorry about that. <laughs> Let me open it again. again and click on the slideshow button again and hope this is working now okay so architecture task for specific work items are to talk about requirements use cases vocabulary i'm going to talk about that in detail then uh, specific link relation types to define the types here um, going into interoperability profile, collect uh, requirements and define um, a plugin mechanism, uh, mechanism for having um, a plug and play interoperability of different devices where you just combine them out of the box and put them together in context, hook them up to consumers and start working with them. Um, thing description templates, talking about classes and things, classes of things and an inheritance mechanism and modularization of thing descriptions, complex interactions already mentioned by Michael McCool. Lifecycle, uh, this is where I'm going to go into more detail. Terminology for states and transitions for products, devices and information. Onboarding, how trust can be established between things and gateways and identify management. So in this presentation, I'm going to cover requirements, use cases and vocabulary and the work we have been doing so far. I'm going to talk about the interoperability profiles and the lifecycle work. 
and in terms of use cases, we do have 20 new use cases in the pipeline and more are to come. So while we're speaking, uh, people are creating merge requests and contributing with use case descriptions. Uh, we do have a template which is uh, simple and straightforward. It basically asks for motivation. It asks for what stakeholders are involved in a use case, what kind of typical flows are there, uh, potential variations, and uh, already trying to assess the potential gaps and things that need to happen um, to uh, web of things specifications, multiply architecture, uh, thing description, security. Uh, protocol binding and others. Um, we have active contributions and I believe this list is outdated. We have additional contributors. Uh, specifically, we do have a Fraunhofer and a couple of others. Um, so if you're not in the list and on this call, apologies. Uh, this slide is a little bit older. Um, in terms of target domains, we include smart cities, industrial domains, transportation, manufacturing logistics, so you may say, well, um, industrial and commercial um, deployments as well as also uh, home use cases, smart cities, smart grids, healthcare, retail, and several technology use cases which are more or less horizontal, so they are touching and affecting multiple domains. Um, these are the use cases and categories that we currently have been collecting. Two slides. Um, I'm not going to read all of that, but they're very important, just the, the high level bullets. So, um, one of the very essential points is multi vendor system integration, which means um, interoperability out of the box, being able to define digital twins for devices that allow to create complex models that allow simulations, that allow troubleshooting in real time by having real time data, doing predict uh, predictions, doing analytics, minimizing downtime, notifying people about downtimes, and uh, also performing simulations. Um, multi vendor and protocol interoperability is an important use case in general. Communication across different protocols, having gateways, being able to transfer um, the same abstract level in terms of thing description, in terms of, I would call it device model across different protocols. Then we have a couple of uh, accessibility use cases that were uh, contributed and included from an MMI group. We have automotive use cases. This is just an exemplary one, smart car configuration management. Um, we are not trying to be exhaustive here. We are trying to find one key use case for a category and for a domain. And um, if there are many variations or additional ones, we are trying to get these the key requirements for these specific cases. Um, then for energy and smart grid, we uh, have a use case for integration uh, of generation, storage, grid management, and consumption of energy. Transportation, we have a very generic um, collection of descriptions about fleet management for public transport, shipping, air cargo, train cargo. Smart buildings, uh, two use cases right now. Commercial buildings, large scale buildings, and also sensor networks for more privately managed or smaller buildings. Then uh, shared devices and resources, a critical point when a device um, can be controlled by multiple users, how to make sure that they um, don't interfere and don't uh, issue contradicting commands, for example, issue contradicting actions, conflicting things. Michael, do you want to take questions now? Um, I have another slide, but we can take questions on this slide, yeah. Josie, go ahead. Oh, I just saw the next slide at agriculture on it. Um, I was going to ask about manufacturing and agriculture because this type of um, 
approach is, is really good for it. So I saw it in the next slide. So I think you'll answer my question in the next slide. Okay. If not, then just chime in again, please. Right, Michael. Mm -hmm. Then we have Freetail, where we interconnect and uh, integrate multiple devices into common retail workflows. Audio video, um, that's a use case contributed by a broadcaster to synchronize home devices with TV program content. Um, agriculture, smart agriculture, greenhouse horticulture to create an optimal environment for growing plants by combining sensors and gateways and measuring all kinds of environment data, including temperature and uh, climate to optimize the uh, plant growing environment. Smart city, to manage mobile devices and sensors in a smart city. Health monitoring for uh, public health and private health. Um, specifically, well, it gained recent attention due to coronavirus. Um, manufacturing to monitor production lines and plants and predict and prevent fault conditions by having well metrics and sensor data and being able to find deviations of expected behavior quite early anomalies. Um, Multimodal system integration, that's another um, MMI use case and category. A common device lifecycle model, I'm going to talk about that further on. And uh, something that came in recently, use cases for OAuth to flow, to be able to make sure that we address the right requirements and the flows that are needed. So these are, is the current list and the initial list um, we're working on. Um, we have decided and we want to shortlist the use cases to make sure that they address real market needs and also to make best use of limited resources. And we also want to prioritize use cases that grow the IoT market in general and also the water adoption. So we want to focus on the deep level requirement analysis and future work um, to make sure that it meets market demands. So we try to answer the primary question of what advantage the use of what brings to spec adopters. So this is basically the process that we are implementing where we are in the yellow orange block at the moment. So you can imagine the timeline on the bottom of the, of the diagram. We have a list and a set of use cases. We are doing a short listing. I'm going to talk about the process in a minute. And based on the short list, we do another iteration where we go into gaps, uh, identify potential new building blocks that need to be addressed. One um, obvious candidate is a discovery um, component and the corresponding directory. Um, Another potential outcome can be a gap of an existing specification. And uh, these are described in requirement documents. So we already started to do that. And also system configuration can be a gap. And these requirements then address uh, different deliverables. So security, privacy, guidelines and documents, um, thing description, scripting, discovery and profile. Um, we are um, almost starting to have a to have a vote. So we want to um, ask all working group and interest group members uh, about their personal um, or company's assessment of the use cases. So we are conducting a W3C questionnaire. We plan to publish it this week. It is. Um, basically asking for all of these use cases, whether there is, um, whether this is a business critical use case for uh, a respondent, whether it is um, less critical, whether it's nice to have or completely uninteresting. And also in terms of future work and doing the deep dive, of course, we're looking for uh, domain experts and champions who can help to identify requirements to make sure that the work is well grounded 
on expertise also. Um, I already mentioned that we uh, create a one page requirements document, we follow a template and there's a couple of examples. The work has started, um, but we are currently more in the yeah, consolidate use cases um, phase and just starting on requirements. We have, I think, two examples, two or three examples at the moment. Um, one more word on the interest group, interest group use case task force that we recently started for collecting additional use cases. So um, we realized that if we um, are doing this work only in the Web of Things working group, we are limiting the um, scope and we are limiting, limiting the domains to only working group participants who are already members. And we want to make sure that we collect input from a wider IoT market audience in terms of scenarios, in terms of use cases, in terms of requirements. We are trying to be as open as possible to get all input uh, on the plate to review everything, every contribution, and to make sure that the Web of Things specifications match and address the requirements from a wider audience. So we are trying to get as many voices heard as possible. And if this is an open invitation, if anybody on this call has additional requirements, has additional domains that go beyond what we are currently looking in, um, have additional requirements, have additional ideas, please let us know. Please uh, participate in this task force we are conducting usually bi-weekly calls. Um, the next call is going to happen in on Thursday in two weeks. This week is a public holiday in Germany, so we are um, canceling this week's call. So the next one is in two weeks. And the output is going to be an interest group document um, where we are collecting and describing every input. So everything that's contributed is going to go into this document without any shortlisting or anything. Okay, that's um, the material I have on the use case work that we have been doing so far. Are there any questions? Can you, Can you include a link to the use case repo in your presentation? I have a reference section at the end of the deck. Okay. In terms of agenda, I think now would be Michael McCool's turn again. Or am I? I, don't, I probably have not seen the latest agenda, so I can go on. Yeah, um, with uh, Lifecycle. Okay. No. Okay, good. So, in terms of Lifecycle, we have been conducting discussions um, during the last couple of months um, in the Architecture Task Force. So we have the goal to describe the oper operational lifecycle model across different standards. We want to describe the security model, we want to describe state transitions and states, and we don't want to impose any new lifecycle on any of the adopters of the standard. Um, one goal of this exercise is to align the terminology to make sure if we um, apply Web of Things on a specific protocol which has an underlying state machine or a deployment model or a security provisioning scheme that um, people understand the same, well, have a notion of the same terminology. And also this is important for our work inside our, uh, the Web of Things group to make sure that also inside the different specifications we use the same terminology. And that's a general objective also of the architecture spec to define terminology, to have the to lay the groundwork um, in terms of architecture, in terms of conceptual introduction, in terms of terminology across different uh, what of things deliverables. We want to identify requirements on architecture, security, clean description, other what deliverables by this life cycle work. 
And we looked into several life cycle models. So we looked into OCF, one M to M, lightweight M to M, and also the RFC 8576 from T2T or G. Um, we have a proposal on a unified state model, which is in discussion. We are planning to conclude on that within a couple of weeks. We have an agreement on fundamental states, um, state names and transitions. There may be some changes, but we are pretty much aligned, I would say. And this is the current draft where we um, start. So we have different layers. We have um, the manufacturing layer, manufacturer's layer in the bottom. Then we have the providers um, who is offering a service. The actor could be a manufacturer or service provider, or also the device owner on, on top of. We have the application itself application because um, there is also the embedded, well, runtime, which uh, exposes scripting APIs for consumption um, of the underlying uh, web of things, thing by applications. Um, I'm probably not, <laughs> Well, we don't have enough time to go into all of the details and uh, things are still in discussion. I wanted to include this slide to give you a, a general idea where we are working on and in which direction we go. So basically we have the initial state which is manufactured or at a later point in time, it can also be a state when a device is being basically reset into the initial state when it is when it has been decommissioned, it is going to be treated like a new device that is going to be onboarded in a different scenario or to a different consumer. Then we have the bootstrapped and onboarded scenario, uh, state, which is um, uh, usually including uh, assigning an identity, um, assigning ownership, uh, doing some initial provisioning of keys of security, um, certificates or tokens and from this state we are going into an operational state um, there are two different layers here the operational which means that the device is basically connected and uh, reachable via protocol and what operational includes a little bit more it includes also that an um, application is um, running or an application is working and uh, implementing the behavior of things. And from this state, from the operational states, which may be on a specific device, it may be a single state. Um, also, um, when we have a simple sensor device, there is no what application. So it's just a plain operational state. And from there, we can go into maintenance and um, reprovisioning keys, doing software updates and things like that. And from this maintenance state, go back to manufactured or well, decommissioned. And we also uh, consider a destroyed or permanently disabled uh, state where a device intentionally uh, is no longer active and can never be reactivated. This is important for security critical deployments. Um, we also have been starting. Can you give a quick summary where you had to extend or deviate from the model in RFC 8576? Um, so the intention is not to deviate in any way. Okay. <laughs> so that one has been around for, for almost a decade and uh, uh, it turned out to be pretty stable. And it would be nice to, to have something like a mapping between the uh, 8576 uh, um, terminology and the terminology that you are developing. Of course, you, you have different, you have identifiable components that, that we are not discussing in 8576. So there is going to be some, some difference, but it would be nice to have some mapping. 
Um, yeah, I completely agree, Karsten. Uh, we don't want to introduce or invent or reinvent the wheel. We don't want to impose new requirements on devices. We want to describe what's out there in the field, what has been adopted. We have this ad additional application component, which may have some additional consequences in terms of key provisioning and things like that for dedicated use cases. But um, you should be able to find your model in this picture. And if not, please shout <laughs> or reach out to us and, and help us. Certainly one thing that came up, Kirsten, was the need for layered keys. So it turns out devices get provisioned with keys several times at different layers. And uh, that was a little tricky to capture. Um, there isn't just one provisioning step. You actually have layers. All right, thank you. Um, then we also started talking about system life cycle, where a thing life cycle, which is basically modeling just what happens on the device into a wider system life cycle, where a device is registered um, with a thing directory or also registered with a consumer, where some initial trust level has to be established with the consumer, and also something may happen may have to happen on a consumer, like um, having a list of device IDs that are registered and that are trusted and that are permitted to send information, send data to, to a consumer. Like when you think about cloud service use cases where multiple devices can, um, can provide sensor information, you want to make sure that devices are authenticated and that our de devices are authorized to actually consume and work generate uh, data for the service. Same thing um, applies to a thing directory when um, an additional component in the architecture picture needs to be introduced. Uh, we currently don't have explicitly in the architecture picture a thing directory. And this has some, this extension has some, some consequences. And this is just an example. Um, to illustrate, this is a proposal, so it's, it's not yet consolidated, it's just something um, to illustrate also things that we need to look into, where we have a device and we have a consumer, and um, on the left-hand side we see the device owner, and on the consumer side we see somebody who is operating the consumer or owns the consumer. It can be the same guy. And at some point in time, the device of that has been initialized or started. It is registered in the directory. It is published in a way and can be discovered by somebody who wants to use it and hook it up on the consumer. We need to work on the state transition names on the uh, on the message names here and align them. So these are coming from different uh, from different sources and we need to make sure that we are using the same name. So you won't be able at the moment to find a mapping between these names and the diagram in the previous picture. Just a word of warning. So we're working. So Michael, um, I have a comment here, but before that, there's someone else in the queue ahead of me. Um, Marie has been there for a while. Okay. I'm not there anymore. I was answered. Oh, you were, okay. Uh, yeah, my comment here is note that discovery is actually also needed during onboarding. So if I have a new device and I have to like register with the system, I have to discover the places to register it with. So discovery isn't just about discovering devices that have already been onboarded. It's also about devices figuring out how to connect and onboard to an existing system. I think we need some additional flows here. And this is just, just one example flow to show the different uh, entities that we have, and specifically to show that there is a thing directory which is going to be involved in some additional flows and, and use cases. Yeah, and actually one example of a, a flow complication, discovery can go either direction. So I might discover devices that, are, that want to be onboarded or in an onboarding state. I might also have devices discovering infrastructure they can onboard to, and different uh, protocols approach this different ways, which adds complexity to the, the problem. I agree. And that would be a, another flow, a different flow. Okay. 
Okay, and that concludes the part on the life cycle. Are there any questions? You said you uploaded your slides somewhere, but I didn't get where. Um, I uploaded them to a fork. <laughs> I didn't. I did not yet have time to create a merge request. It's on my fork of the T two TRG repo. Okay. So Michael, I put my presentations under the Watt presentations directory in the Watt repo. Maybe you can put the presentation there and just share a link later. I think after the meetings, okay. That's also fine. Mm -hmm. um, profiles. So that's also one of the charter items for the architecture group. Um, the architecture itself, whoops, sorry. The architecture spec itself and the thing description define a powerful mechanism and a format for describing very, very different devices with the intention to be able to describe everything that's out there in the field. That's in the brown field. Um, however, there is intentionally and by design, there are only very few normative requirements on devices. And um, we have a couple of use cases that require more, um, yeah, interoperability in terms of out of the box, in terms of, yeah, if I get a new device, I don't want to create a new client. And uh, in general, if you want, if you wanted to implement a generic uh, generic client for all kinds of thing descriptions, it's impossible to implement. Just imagine one flavor of a protocol that's um, only used in a specific uh, device, maybe because it's an implementation bug and behaving specifically in a way, or whatever. Or imagine complexity in terms of thing description length and. Uh, Depth and all kind of plain simple things like um, maximum length of strings, where many implementations still assume it's um, uh, two to the power of 16, 65,000 something characters. So um, the motivation is to make interoperability easy, which means um, to create a profile and um, by first generating a generic profiling me mechanism, which um, can be used to describe a profile or multiple profiles in an uh, unambiguous way. And um, it's not limited to a single profile that can be defining multiple profiles, but in terms of um, having um, improved interoperability, we also want to define a core profile, which means to define a subset of the thing description for use with selected protocols, define additional constraints. There have been several plug fests uh, that were conducted in the uh, what group and uh, tests were done during development. So a lot of work has been already done and uh, things have been identified to work and things have been some some reasonable baseline assumptions have been made and this knowledge is in the interest group it's in the uh, plug first participants heads and in some documents and this can be formalized in terms of a formal profile specification additional profiles for example for think templates or other protocols will be defined this may be happening as part of the profile work it may be happening also potentially in the thing description specification itself. Um, and we're going to see how the work turns out. This is just illustrating at a very high level what we are talking about when we consider a what core profile. So if you consider all the vertical blocks, just the expressiveness of what we can describe in the thing description. Uh, with a protocol binding. Then the core profile is defining a subset. It is selecting features um, of properties. It's making additional constraints, the same on actions, the same on events, um, on links and on security. Um, last year, 
we uh, had a submission of a profile, Strawman, which is um, a very early write down of um, basically thoughts that I was having when I was thinking about what needs to happen in terms of improving interoperability. So it's an Oracle submission. Um, it's available publicly, it's in the GitHub repo. I have a link later on in the presentation on that. Um, it also defines or describes and uses a generic profiling mechanism. I hope it's an easy to read document. It needs significant discussions and more work and it's uh, just a company contribution. So it is not something that has been agreed on so far or that is an output of a working group. Um, the work on the profile specification unfortunately stalled for several months since the architecture task force um, has limited bandwidth in terms of cost, also in terms of um, time that people can work on. So we pushed the profile work a little bit out since a couple of months. And um, as Michael mentioned, we are going to have an upcoming face-to-face uh, -face in two weeks and or three weeks. And the profile work will be resumed there. And I hope we are going to make progress quickly. Um, these are the um, promised references. So we are on GitHub. Um, there is the architecture repo. There is uh, a subdirectory in terms of use cases. All uh, contribution documents, proposals for lifecycle are on the proposals lifecycle. And the profiles specification is on a, a separate repo. And that concludes the slide part of, my, yeah, of this slot. So are there questions, discussion items? And we are running a little bit late and I'm sorry for that. Thank you, Michael. Um, if there are no more questions, we can move to the next part. But but th thanks a lot for doing this, especially the use cases work. I think it's highly useful for us to share those use cases across organizations because that's a common thing that we need in, in, in our standards work on, on, on different protocols and, and data. So I think it's highly useful that you are you have a very open process for that. Yeah. Well, one thing we should mention is um, <clears throat> I guess we're in the middle of consolidating, but one of the issues is categories, like, uh, you know, what big buckets do use cases fall into? The other issue is horizontal versus vertical use cases. So we have a bunch of vertical use cases. Um, we also have a bunch of same horizontal technologies, let's say, like uh, discovery or, or security or whatever that, that kind of cross across those. Um, and so we, as we do the requirements, we're going to be sorting out a, a lot of that, I hope. Um, and uh, trying to organize things better. But right now, um, I would say we have a large amount of uh, input that we we're, we're still need to, to put in the categories and organize and also prioritize, as Michael was saying. But I think more input is always good. I think we'll probably do a round of, of, of uh, consolidation and prioritizing, but I think the, we're we'll always be, uh, I think, uh, I think collecting use cases is an ongoing activity and uh, we'll probably be collecting more as time goes on and refining our, our models. Um, exactly. And uh, just again, an invitation, if you have any additional use case and uh, we can certainly spin off, spin off another uh, call dedicated for uh, this discussion, if there is anything you want us to consider and to take into account. Please just let us know. Okay, and I'm going to create a merge request with these slides in, in a minute. Great, thank you. Then I guess we can move to- uh, I already put other. your slides into the repository because I found your repository and copied things over. Okay, thanks a lot, Carsten. Okay, let me stop sharing.
Yeah, we are 12 minutes late, I think. So, Michael, if you can do the discovery thing, might be able to compress the break a little bit, but uh, we still can do it in a little bit less time than we thought. Give me a second to show my screen. Hey, Karsten, could you check out what you copied across? Because I think you grabbed the HTML, not the PDF. I did. Wait a minute. <laughs> Thank <second>. you. <laughs> Um, okay, so people hear me? So I want to talk about the work on discovery. So we created uh, a task force just to work on discovery. Um, and later on in the presentation, uh, there's a number of links to a repository that has a lot of design and requirements documents that kind of back up some of the stuff. We don't yet have a, a draft, uh, you know, uh, uh, public working draft of the actual spec, but the intention is to create a separate uh, specification document um, that would uh, define the discovery process. One of our challenges with discovery is not reinventing the wheel. So we, we don't want to, um, you know, uh, conflict uh, with existing discovery mechanisms. In fact, we want to build upon them. So I'll talk about that in a minute. The other thing I want to say at the outset is discovery is defined in our use case as the mechanism by which you retrieve thing descriptions. It's not necessarily on the LAN, like it's not like a broadcast, you know, mechanism. It could be across the internet. You could look for TDs that are in Singapore near the park or something like this. So we we actually, even though you're saying it's in Canada. So I think that uh, we are looking at a, a generalized pro problem of simply finding TDs. So, you know, I started by writing down a number of requirements. Um, so one is, you know, just a set of things we should be able to do. Um, and this kind of relates to the use cases. Um, I think that, uh, you know, one thing that came up was people want to do localizable discovery. So you want to be able to say, you know, I want things descriptions in a certain place or location. This actually gets tricky because we don't currently have a standardized geolocation uh, mechanism for TDs. Um, and we also, you know, want to be able to do, you know, discovery that spans network boundaries um, in some use cases. So I might want to look for you know, things across a campus, for example, um, and, uh, you know, maybe over several different network domains. Um, we also did a lot of work in the past on semantic queries and so because we are adding semantic annotation, we want to be able to have some ability to use that information. And there's a lot of great technology available. At the same time, we don't want to burden, you know, simpler devices from having to deal with a bunch of RDF stuff. So we have to walk the same line we do with the TD is how do we support semantic query without burdening uh, smaller implementations. Um, and we also have uh, different use cases. So we have large numbers of things we have to worry about and we might need a directory service for that. We also want to do self-identifying devices. So devices that has have one TD and they just want to you know, make it available. Now, to make this all more interesting and complicated, we have to preserve privacy. So TDs contain a lot of metadata about devices. When devices can be associated with a person, that metadata can be used to infer things about a person. And even just getting access to the metadata uh, can use it like to infer things like location. So if you knew, for example, what set of devices were near a person, you might be able to infer the location of that person. You don't even care about the actual information in the, in the, in the metadata per se, you're just using it as a fingerprint. So there's all kinds of, of privacy risks we have to worry about, um, and W3C is very sensitive about privacy. So one of the things we have to come up with is a way to do this you know, discover metadata without blowing privacy. Um, and so we need to worry about a lot of things. Uh, first bulwark is, you know, distributing things only to authenticated and authorized users. The other thing is, you know, plugging leaks. So not broadcasting uh, metadata, but instead uh, putting it behind a firewall. And, and we have to be uh, it's tricky because we have to worry about inferencing problems. So it's not just, you know, there's, you can't just say there's no PII, no personal information in a TD, so don't worry about it. It's not true. 
because you can always use information in TDA to infer things from relationships. And uh, this is a very uh, 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 tricky uh, raffle. And finally, you know, like I said, we don't want to reinvent the wheel. So how do we align with existing standards? How do we build upon them um, and so forth? And finally, there's discovery support in the scripting API. We make sure that, you know, that works and is simple to use. And in context in which privacy is an issue, it shouldn't be leaking information that could allow people to do like fingerprinting. So it's a, it's a tall order, lots of things. So as a first step, uh, I had a proposal, which is basically using a, a two-phase architecture. So the idea is to have, um, you know, an introduction phase and an exploration phase. Another name for introduction would be first contact. Basically, how do you start? You know, you you don't know anything about the environment you're in. How do you start the discovery process? And so, you know, one of the issues here is it needs to be open. So we don't have any access rights to start with. So, you know, we have to like have a way to bootstrap without having access rights. It shouldn't be heavyweight. So, you know, small devices may need to do this. They may need to do it even when they're onboarding, as mentioned before. So it has to be lightweight. And, uh, but it shouldn't leak privacy information. So we have to actually, because we're having it as an open process, that first bootstrap phase should basically have no metadata about devices. It should just be kind of an onboarding process. So the idea of a two-phase approach is that you, you do kind of this first contact protocol, and the only purpose is to figure out how to actually access the, the metadata. Before you can access the metadata, you have to authorize with an exploration service. Now, later on, I equate exploration with directories, but uh, actually, in theory, you could have other ways to do exploration, as long as it satisfies the properties that you have to authenticate against it before you can get access to metadata. Um, but I ended the talk at length about a directory service which would be a normative specification for a, a service that would be able to respond to a request for, for uh, TD metadata. In fact, another way of exploration would be accessing TDs directly from a device without going through a directory service, but that would have the same requirements for authentication and authorization in order to satisfy the privacy requirements. Um, yeah, so more information on this, you know, um, the output, the first contact is the address of an exploration service. And for example, a URL for directory service. Um, it does not have to be a broadcast mechanism. So one of the things we've been talking about is using DNS um, and using DNS, maybe that spans um, uh, you know, the network, maybe even using extensions of DNS that do location-based discovery. Um, and uh, it could also be uh, federated directories. So actually, um, you might have one directory introducing you to another one. Um, the one requirement we state is that when you get a URL back, you shouldn't be baking information into that URL with the type of device. So don't return a URL from your introduction that is like my insulin uh, pump, right? Because you don't want to have uh, any inference from the name of the URL, what the type of device is. So even if it's a self-identifying device, that introduction URL needs to be opaque in some way. Um, we've looked at multiple ways of introductions. So you could have all kinds of things to do introductions. The only the constraint, as I said, is that it gives you a link uh, at the back end. Um, and uh, there is already some specifications for self-identifying devices, uh, like the dot well-known thing. We need to clarify exactly how that's used. Um, and then for all, actually for several other mechanisms, we need to add a few bit of information. For example, to use DNS SD, we have to define the service name for, uh, for our services. Um, there's also issues with certain introductions only having fixed URLs or fixed addresses. So how do we map from a fixed address to something that might be a different place to the network, uh, depending on, you know, uh, NAT and, and registrations and so forth. Um, 
Now there are uh, the relationship I'll mention later on to um, core RD, et cetera. A lot of these systems basically have a list of typed links. And so what we can do with these kind of mechanisms is use them as introduction services, have a typed link for directory service, and then point to the directory from something like a core RD. So the idea is don't pack all the metadata into these directories uh, are these uh, kind of services, instead use them as an index into a directory service. The reason being is in the directory service can have strong authentication authorization before we release the TD metadata. Um, and uh, we may have different types. And I think the two main types that come up are pointing directly at a device that self-identifies uh, its TD and pointing to a directory service. So I think we might, at the minimum, have two different types of links that need to be added to things like core RDs and DID documents and DNS, et cetera. Okay. Uh, let's get that. Okay, so then once you've uh, gone to the first contact, then you need to do uh, exploration. You need to authenticate. Um, and then an authentication may actually require some like OAuth. We have to go off somewhere else and get a token and come back. Um, and then you can get access to a directory service. Now, directory has you know, a number of TDs. So you have to have a way to select the, the ones you want. So we, we realized that there's different layers of query. You might want to do simple query or template search. You might want to do full-blown uh, uh, RDF Sparkle queries. Um, and uh, not all you know, gateways will want to implement a Sparkle query mechanism. So we are looking at some intermediate lightweight mechanisms. Uh, and I'll mention some later based on JSON uh, path and so forth. There's also issues with um, timeouts, so time to live. There's a problem that if something's registered directory and the device dies or goes away or is moved or something, we have to have a way to clean out the directory of obsolete devices. Um, and also we need to have an onboarding mechanism. So when devices onboard, they register themselves with their directory or the directory discovers them uh, in the opposite way. Um, and uh, let's see, yeah. And there's also this issue of IDs. So one of the things that came up in the privacy discussion is rotating identifiers so that they can minimize the tracking surface. But if, you, if, a, if a device changes identifier, then the, device, the directories need to be notified of the change and the directories may need to notify users of the change. And so there has to be kind of a, well, there may have to be a notification mechanism for if you want to rotate identifiers. And the idea here is that if a malicious user cached a TD from long ago, um, they have the old ID. If they're not on the notification list for the updates, they don't get notified of the new change. And so they would not know it. Okay, so privacy. Um, okay, so this two phase approach is you know, nice. It helps us get some privacy, but it's not sufficient. Okay, there's also the problem of, uh, you know, um, even if I just get a list of directory services that are available in a certain location, I can use that to infer the location of the person finding the directories. So the API design can't even, in a browser context at least, give me a list of available exploration services because that could be used as a fingerprint, my location. So we need to uh, instead have a directory mechanism where we say what we want, and the system somehow magically gives it to us, um, and only if we're authorized to have that information. And so we have to be very careful about how we design the APIs um, to make sure that we're, we're preserving information and let people infer things they shouldn't know. Um, and I'm also, by the way, looking at an orthogonal problem of uh, a non-browser execution context, like edge workers running in a gateway, and uh, they may have different requirements than in the browser. Okay, so I actually wanted to uh, point at a number of uh, things that we've done. Um, 
And I'm actually going to give you a, a grand tour of uh, what we have in uh, in the Watt Discovery repo. And so these are the links to later on. You can look at this. But, um, but basically, we have some proposals. And the only one here really is the two-phase directory uh, system. But we also are collecting, you know, implementations. Um, and one of them I'm going to talk about later on is the Fraunhofer LinkSmart system, which is a prototype directory service, basically. Um, we also have, you know, been collecting requirements. So we have, you know, sets of requirements about things. And this is kind of where we get alignment on, on uh, what we need here. One of the things we need to do though here is connect these to use cases. So once the use case uh, stuff sorts itself out, we need to look across it horizontally and confirm that we, you know, have captured these the right requirements for the use cases that we're actually considering. Um, it's a bit out of order. In theory, we do the use cases first and then extract requirements, but I think we're more in the iterative prototyping model than the uh, waterfall model. Um, given the requirements, then we have a bunch of design decisions we've been discussing. So we basically made the resolution that the two-phase architecture makes sense, and we will follow that, that strategy. Um, and uh, and then the uh, some details there. Now, one thing we're in discussion, though, still is what exact introduction mechanisms we need to support. Uh, it turns out that different introductions may need some additional work to enable for this. We, for example, need to define a service label for DNS SD. For DIDs, they return a bunch of typed links we needed to find some type labels for DID documents for those to be enabled for DIDs. For QR codes, uh, we have the problem that the QR code may be printed, in which case it's fixed. So how does that work? How do we, uh, maybe we're in a home environment and we're behind the NAT, so we don't actually know the URL or the IP number of our device. So how do we actually go from the QR code to the device? or to the, uh, to the TD. And actually, it's kind of related to the problem of how do we have stable URLs for TDs. So one way around this is to use DIDs, um, which are decentralized identifiers, which then provide a stable identifier that can be resolved into a set of links. And those links can be updated. Um, but that's still in flight, and we're not quite sure. I think if QR code is on a display, though, it becomes a lot easier if you can display a QR code or in some way display uh, or broadcast a discovery link, um, then you can update it. And one version of that is actually a Bluetooth beacon, which can be used to broadcast links for discovery. But now this is for devices that are broadcasting um, their label or, or their directory service. The other way around is uh, uh, devices discovering directories and registering with them. So we also have the issue of making directories discoverable. Um, there's also well-known locations. And so we're, we need to define, you know, what is the well-known location for a TD? And the basic idea here is a very, very, most, the simplest possible exploration service is you just get to a particular location and you'll, you'll get the TD back. However, that get should uh, go through an authentication process which would have to probably have to follow the HTTP protocol for requesting authentication. Because you don't know in advance necessarily what authentication is needed for, for this, this link. But we also, like I said, looking at directory service, we've made some decisions about things uh, that you know we, we're gonna stick to TCP HTTP for now. I think in the future we might consider other things like co-app, but for now to keep the scope uh, simple, we're going to define it in terms of TCP and HTTP, and actually TLS. So we have to, of course, have the link encrypted um, in order to provide any kind of security or privacy. Another uh, decision, which actually is up in the air right now because we're still debating it, is JSON versus JSON LD. So does a directory return JSON or JSON LD? 
If it returns JSON LD, then the implication is that it needs to have a context and it needs to have, you know, uh, queries should also, you know, obey the naming rules for like, uh, for semantics. This actually is kind of tricky and we are currently uh, debating how to do this. One of the issues is a lot of the query mechanisms are allowed to return partial or part of a TD. Um, but then it becomes tricky to define what the context is, especially if you have nested contexts or things like this. So we um, are currently uh, just realized, in fact, just last week of some complications if we do want to support JSON LD. And so we're currently debating how to do this. Um, so right now the decision is, is listed as just pretend it's JSON, but we'd like to figure out how to do, do the semantics correctly. And this is semantics in the context of keyword searches, right? So if you want to do full semantics with Sparkle, of course, it's JSON LD. This is in the context of a lightweight uh, keyword template based search. Another issue that comes up is pagination. If you have, you know, a directory service with say thousands of TDs, you give it a query that basically says, give me all your TDs then you could have a really, really huge download. And so we don't wanna do that in a single transaction. So instead we wanna paginate and have, you know, next, next, next kind of things. And we are looking at a, an interface that does uh, one TD at a time, pagination. However, currently TDs can be unbounded in length, uh, which is, a, you know, you could don't wanna have a gigabyte long TD as a pathological example. So we need to probably look at this and, and either have profiles that limit the length of TDs and or have some way of paginating through a single TD if it's, a, if it's especially long. And this is actually um, also needed for protocols that have uh, limits on amount of data in a single transaction. Finally, for query mechanisms, we are looking at uh, query support and different ways to do query. I think Sparkle is kind of like the, the best way for us to do RDF um, and semantic query, and it's fully general. It's also very, very powerful and is maybe overkill for small devices. So we're looking now at uh, the LinkSmart uh, system I mentioned before, has both JSON path and XPath uh, prototyping, and we're gonna be experimenting with that in the PlugFest next week. Um, and it actually does support pagination and other things. Um, there's also the issue of metadata. So what if we have extra data about a TD, like for example, the timestamp at which it was registered, how old it is, uh, what its time to live is, that sort of thing. So we can't necessarily add that data to the TD because uh, later on we're contemplating in the security group adding a way to sign TDs um, with a, a, a JSON LD proof section. So we don't want to invalidate the signature by having the directory modify the TD. So we have to figure out how to do out of band uh, data returns. And so very likely the information model for the directory will have metadata associated with TDs, but not part of TDs. And we need to think about an information model for directories that allow that. Um, let's see what other interesting things are here. Um, we have to decide what authorization schemes to support. So similar to profiles, we'd like to have a finite number so that uh, people know exactly what we need to implement in order to support directories. And so, so far we have uh, this short list um, that you know, we wanna have at least the basic stuff, but we also wanna have uh, some like tokens support um, mechanisms where you know, the credentials to get an authorization token are provided in a separate device than where you actually use, use the authentication. One final thing that we think is interesting uh, design decision is the, the, the directory network API we want to describe in a TD. So the directory service itself is essentially a virtual thing. And why this is interesting is it allows directories to index other directories. So that means we can have federated directories where we can search a directory. Instead of finding a thing, we might find additional directories where we might find more things. So a discovery process might end up being recursive 
and walking through a bunch of directories. Of course, we have to way to limit this. And one logical way to limit it would be by spatial location or doing spatial query. So what we have to then look at, you know, how do we get spatial information um, or number of network hops or number of directory hops. So we, we just, uh, however, right now, we're not really looking at that. We just made the decision to make the directory API in the TD as a, as a, as a description that allows us to do this later on. I think right, right now we're not uh, specifying how to do a recursive search. Um, right, and there's a bunch of other things we're talking about, um, web ID, um, uh, what is the exact set of introductory mechanisms and so forth. Okay, so that's all I want to say there. Um, and, and again, this repo has uh, other information here. I won't go into it, but we have some background information as well. And if I go back to my slides. So I, I have a couple of links here um, on prior work and background. So there's been a lot of work and we're trying to index existing mechanisms um, for discovery and figure out how they can work within the Watt uh, sort of architecture. And also we're still you know, willing to accept additional proposals one thing we wanted to do was capture previous work and previous years uh, for discovery, especially for semantic discovery. Right now, the link smart system that we're looking at is really focused on the lightweight keyword and template based search, not on, on semantic search per se. Well, you can certainly do keyword searches for particular semantic keys. Okay. Um, Michael, um, we are already 10 minutes into our break. Oh, we are. Okay. Well, I think I'm basically done. I'll skip this. And I had some discussion points. I guess what we should do is, um, yeah, sorry, I went a little long. Um, so interesting. We, we, we had some of this discussion last week in, in the yeah, last. We did. Um, but not everyone who was here was at that discussion. Maybe I can simply summarize. Do we want to take five minutes for discussion and then, uh, and then have a break, a delayed break. Yeah, we we already have a delayed break, and uh, we cannot go under ten minutes for a break. Right. Uh, so uh, I think we should have that break now. Okay. So why don't we have the break, and then um, yeah, let's look, let's let's discuss the agenda when we get back then. Okay. Okay. So ten oh, minute okay. breaks, and time wise, hold on. So we are reconvening at 13.40. Right. World time. And those who have uh, slides for the next segment, please make sure that Ari and I have those because we need to upload them. Okay. So 40, 40 past, we'll reconvene. Yes. Let me stop sharing.
Uh, Ariel Kirsten, is one of you there right now? I am. I'd like to propose what to do with the agenda here. Yes. So if I can have two minutes to wrap up, and then I think what yes. we can do is defer discussion to some later meeting, either a wishy call or a discovery task force call. So I think I, uh, but the, it's tricky because we're about to go into a podcast face to face. So I'd like to uh, identify a point which we can have discussion and then uh, defer it. So what's our, uh, what's your next wishy call? That's on June thirtieth. Uh, so th there already is a little bit of agenda uh, for that, but I think we should accommodate. Should be able to accommodate that. Okay. So <clears throat> I guess I just want to say uh, small more things. First of all, identify that, and then also just mention. I guess the uh, well. Uh, that we need to do some work around picking a query language and picking introduction protocols. Which I think is our main activity next little while. But uh, I think the discussion points can also include things like core RD integration. So I, I pushed the the link to the agenda items. Uh, okay. For the next the chat. Okay. So how 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 should we call that agenda item? I'd say what. Discovery discussion. And I would link back to this presentation so that people. Uh, can we get this a little bit more specific? What's that? Can we get that a little bit more specific than just what discovery well, discussion? It's basically discussing this, this slide. So I wanted to have uh, some discussion time in this workshop. It's not going to happen now. So I want to continue um, to get feedback on the what design basically yeah so um but i think it's actually good to give people time to think about it and we can follow up and i'd say let's say you know, 20 minutes whatever we had scheduled for discussion in, the, in this in the workshop well we had 10 minutes for that that was so uh, 10 right. minutes then yeah let's listen to 10 minutes 15 minutes even 10 15. So you're going to add that to the agenda for the next wishy and add a link to the wishy to the current agenda on the workshop. Yes. Okay. So I just sent the, the link to the agenda in the okay. uh, chat. Okay. Well, it's 40 past now, so maybe we yes. should restart. So we're now at the end of the break. Hopefully everyone is, is back. Uh, the next agenda item is the proof of concept. But Michael, do you want to briefly um, wrap up on, on what we decided on the way forward with the previous uh, yes. agenda? Yes, we, we think we have to defer the discussion of the what discovery. So what we decided to do is push it to the next wishy call, which is June 30th. And on the chat, um, Karsten has a link to that agenda. Um, and uh, we will follow up uh, on the discussion at, at that point. And uh, basically, I'll discuss the last slide in this presentation, and we can follow on. Uh, we only have 10 or 15 minutes uh, of discussion time, but we don't have time for it. So let's move on. So what was next on the agenda? You. I am. Okay. Uh, POCs, right? Yes. Right. So, how much time do I have? Uh, twenty minutes total. Well, the, the total is twenty minutes. But uh, who's okay. who's presenting? Jennifer's smart city um, thing. Jennifer, do you want to talk to your slide? I can bring it up here. Give me a second. Sure. And um, my 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 slide is just a single slide, so it should be very short. Okay. Give me a second. And let me start slideshow. Okay. So to give a quick background, um, um, of course, one of the problems that 
GovTech has is many fragmented protocols for sensors and robots. And so this is why we've been working with the W3C Watt team to, uh, to look for solutions that can solve this problem. And of course, Web of Things is, is what we're considering. And so what you see here is a list of the potential use cases that we've discussed with the team here on um, potentially what GovTech is looking to solve with WOT. And um, I'm not going to read all of them, but basically, uh, long story short, the only one that is um, basically in production or going to hopefully go under production is, is the one that you see in the image spot on, which is a smart thermal sensor. And right now it, it's um, been shipped and created and it's a low cost thermal sensor that detects high temperatures in crowds. And um, of course, one of the feature requests that we received was to, to see, see all the high temperature um, locations. And uh, if say like an agency purchased spot on and deployed multiple ones to see it on a map and, and find the areas where there might be like uh, potential uh, fever hotspots. So um, that is uh, that is one of the um, strong contenders we have for uh, POCs right now, and the rest are still under investigation. But we look forward to potentially like adding them as as we get our POC created. But in any case, that's 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 all that's for me. Yeah, and I should say we're capturing these as general use cases in the architecture working group. But we feel these use cases apply to more than just Singapore. They're general smart city use cases. <coughs> okay. People can hear me, right? Okay, so I'm going to um, now the next uh, set of use cases we have are a retail POC. And uh, David Azell, I'm not sure. Are you here, David? Not, I didn't see David on the list of attendees, so I'm going to assume I'm, I'm doing this. But David Azell is, we've been working with Conexus, who is a W3C Watt member. And they basically represent convenience stores and gas stations in uh, in the US mostly. And uh, so that's kind of the context we're looking at. And I'm also uh, in collaboration with Intel on this project uh, with the Intel uh, uh, Open Retail Initiative. So, uh, so basically, there's lots of different use cases uh, for IoT in retail. Now, what's interesting is a lot of these also involve computer vision or AI. So, one of the things that comes up is, and actually, uh, one of the reasons for Intel's interest, frankly, is that there's also, uh, you know, orchestration of IoT devices with uh, AI uh, applications. Uh, you have things like RPD scanners, scanning product codes. You have door sensors, you have security systems, uh, you have uh, person identification and tracking, et cetera. And some of these are AI-based sensors and some of them are just plain old you know, switches on doors. So, um, so anyways, we've been collaborating, uh, we're working with uh, 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 Intel's Open Retail Initiative, which is a project under the IoT group than Intel. Now they've sponsored an open source project called EdgeX Foundry. Uh, which is actually a collaboration among many companies. And so part of the POC is looking at integrating Watt into EdgeX Foundry, um, which will enable not only retail use cases, but other use cases. And of course, Conexus uh, is driving the, the use cases. And kind of our plan was to get things done and it, uh, able to showcase that in, in the fall for a, a conference called NAX. Um, we're not quite sure it's going to happen because of coronavirus, but we're assuming it is, and we're working towards that. Okay, and actually, we're looking at a particular, you know, concrete use case: <clears throat> uh, someone walking into a convenience store and buying an ice cream. And the idea is the person would walk in, they'd open a freezer door, that might have a sensor. Um, the might use computer vision to identify here's a person and also look at the product that's being taken out or maybe an RFID sensor identify the product. Um, and then the person either walks to the counter. And if we assume the, uh, you know, the, the associate is in the back room, they have to be notified to come to the, to the counter to, to, to check out a person. Alternatively, the customer might decide to like walk out the door with the ice cream. 
in which case we have a different kind of notification process to worry about. And so we might just want to simply remind the customer, hey, you have to pay for that, or to like, you know, tell the associate you've lost inventory. So, you know, the architecture, you know, involves, uh, you know, uh, working with uh, EdgeX as kind of the coordination system, coordination platform. There's various input devices and display devices and AI systems and things like notifications that need to be integrated. And actually, one of the things we're looking at is maybe you have an IoT device for your freezer door, maybe you have an AI system for the freezer door opening. And so ideally, the application layer shouldn't care to the same application, regardless of whether it's a real, real device or, or a virtual device. The other thing I wanted to showcase was end user programming. Uh, in the retail environment, you may have to often adapt uh, a system to a given store. That adaptation may have to be done by someone who is basically, you know, a system man, not really a programmer per se. It might even be the store owner. And so how do we make that accessible uh, you know, uh, kind of as easy as making a spreadsheet um, for end user. And so we're currently looking actually, first of all, EdgeX, we're looking at modifying these thing parts. So adding TDs to the metadata system and actually probably running a directory service um, for probably the uh, link smart directory service. And then adding some kind of orchestration capability based on what scripting and or node red. Uh, node red is our number one goal here because we feel that Node-RED works really well uh, for end-user programming. Um, right, and so this is kind of our plan. And so we need to like mine the metadata available already and generate TDs um, and then uh, figure out how to, uh, you know, integrate our directory services with EdgeX and then support uh, uh, Node-RED orchestration. And then finally stand up you know, a, an example based on that, uh, that example of taking buying ice cream. That's it. Um, so I think we probably have a little time for for discussion. It was I guess ten minutes out of twenty, so we have ten minutes for discussing uh, POCs or use cases. I do want to distinguish POC from use case. I think a POC is we're actually trying to build something. Use case is we're defining where we might build something or someone might build something. I think they're related because very often we have a use case and then we also build it. And there is a retail.md uh, use case in the architecture repo that captures the retail use case. And there's a bunch of different use cases for smart city. Actually, I was a bit uh, um, uh, taken to the side by the fact that I had to sort the slides uh, a little bit. Um, did you say how the results of those experiments are documented? Uh, well, it's not done yet, so we we haven't gotten the documentation part. I will say that for PlugFest, um, one of the things I've been trying to do is more formally capture our results from PlugFests. And I think, you know, as part of the PlugFests, we definitely want to walk through some of these POCs, POC implementations, and capture, you know, the pros and cons of different approaches. I think that, you know, for example, for this POC for retail, we're going to be going ahead and using the Link Smart directory, okay? Even though it's not necessarily normative for what we plan to do, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily decided that's going to be the the interface. So we're going to do something, we're going to try it, and we'll see how it works, and then try and capture the results. I think the idea, though, is we have a report out on these POCs that would provide feedback into our use cases. I saw okay, where's, where's that report going? Uh, it would be uh, on our repos, most likely. So we have uh, a use case repo. That'd be one place to capture this. We also have a testing repo um, where we generally capture PlugFest um, reports. I should say we're, we're trying to capture data formally now in terms of you know, CSV files for different uh, pairs of things interoperate and how well. And so I'll have to think about you know, what kind of data we can capture for POCs.
because they're essentially a, a complicated plug fest scenario. But I think a POC is a bit more because it's kind of out in the world. So a plug fest scenario might just be just us, us guys talking. I think a POC is something where we actually are out in the world and there's you know actual real users using it. And so one question here is, you know, should we have questionnaires or something to like capture information or or uh, more formally capture feedback from users? Okay. Any other questions on the proof of concept? I saw Taylor raise his hand. Someone raised their hand on the. Uh... I, I cannot see raised hand. Sorry. Uh, okay, you must have taken it down then. Okay. Any more questions then? Okay. Um, anyways, um, if we have a POC meeting, by the way, um, then we alternate right now between retail and smart city. If you're interested in joining that, uh, send me an email and I can uh, I can invite you. It's an open meeting. It's an IG. Oh, oh, Taylor is back. He was asking about sidewalk labs. Um, so did, can you speak up and ask your question? So they have not reached out to me now. I'm not sure if Taylor can use audio. Uh, Taylor, can you speak? Okay. Uh, Taylor, why don't we follow up by email then? Um, I mean, I certainly, I'd be interested in talking about what Subwalk Labs is doing um, in, and uh, whether there's a POC there, uh, that would be a very interesting. But so far we haven't had any discussion of that nature. So Taylor, can you type your full name into the chat? Okay. Um, thank you. Um, so I think we are done with the current segment. So Michael Costa will be next. Okay. Um, let me let me first. I don't have slides, but let me just summarize really where we are with one data model. Um, this is mostly W3C and, and T to TR2. Um, we have a website that's about almost ready to go live. Um, our SDF language has uh, an internet draft that's proposed that you can go read that basically contains the official documentation for the language. Um, we have, among other things, a playground. And the playground basically has a uh, fairly comprehensive collection of data models, all in SD format and all more or less valid. I noticed a couple of things that still need to be cleaned up, but for the most part, these are uh, these are all valid data models. So, um, I'm basically going to go straight on to explaining what SDF is and how it does. But but basically, at one data model, we are um, basically managing both the language SDF and the uh, set of common models that we're working on to converge across industry. And, you know, Karsten, I'll already jump in if you want to add anything to that summary. Well, we, we had a, a pretty uh, extensive discussion of uh, SDF in, in the Singapore uh, meeting. And uh, actually, the video from that is, is out there as an SDF tutorial. So if you are interested looking more into SDF, uh, th there's an like 20 minute uh, tutorial that, that you can uh, watch. Um, but the, the basic idea is that uh, it makes sense to have a very high level view of the, the data model and interactions uh, provided uh, by, by a certain kind of thing. 
and uh, th that's actually what what SDF uh, allows you to capture. Okay, so um, for example, I hope you can see my um, text editor. Here's an example SDF file for a very simple on off switch definition. And there are some things like namespaces that that work in a very similar way to um, compatible to how they work in JSON LD and in thing description. There are uh, some definitions of objects that are encapsulated sets of events, actions, and properties that have the same semantics as a thing description. And we, I guess, um, I guess we're all aware of that. So yeah, right. There's Karsten just uh, put. Uh, Put up the tutorial. So this example has a definition of a switch uh, object, which is some functionality, functional encapsulation, um, on off switch. It has an on action and an off action. <clears throat> it has a state property. And the data defined the state property as an enum with the string values on and off. And I wanted to show that to sort of illustrate and for some grounding on how this actually um, would be used in a thing description the way we've used things so far. So I've taken a switch uh, description and um, a thing description will use definitions from one data model uh, as semantic tags or semantic anchors to um, for interoperability around concepts and, and these terms that are defined. So where we saw a switch defined with on and off actions and state, um, the, the thing description here is going to just dis describe a, a, a thing that is a simple switch and has no more than just the switch in it. So its type is, um, uh, and basically I've used the, created a namespace here that kind of points to where the definition is. And uh, it's, it's, it uses this JSON pointer uh, syntax which is the same as used in the uh, SDF model to uh, to point to the definition. So here you see this this, this uh, capability namespace cap uh, expands to one DM exploratory cap, which is a model that's going to be in the uh, exploratory uh, folder in one DM. <clears throat> Pardon me. And uh, this uh, this thing description basically describes a, a, a switch that as defined as an SDF object. So it, it has a property, it has a state property that's defined as, uh, again, with that type annotation that points to the uh, the state property definition in the SDF file. And it has an on, on and off actions that, um, that each point to their respective, um, respective um, definitions in the 1DM file. So the, the type is on, um, SDF object switch, SDF action on, and that sort of uniquely, uniquely defines that, that definition without any name conflicts within that namespace and across namespaces, and uh, points to these, these unique definitions. Now, there's no link data behind there. You can't go there and expand that. That's basically going to point to this, uh, this node in a JSON file. So there's some further work to <clears throat> to expand these through the IoT schema uh, activity to to give them uh, a little more semantics behind there. But but this is basically how you would point to elements of a de definition. We don't really need to worry about uh, what's behind that at this point. So this is basically the obvious way of using uh, thing description of using uh, SDF one data model definitions in a thing description. So I can build thing descriptions that are, um, um, you have semantic anchors in them that are based on these, uh, these definitions in one data model. All right, so I can make thing descriptions now. Um, so to point out this, these have no protocol bindings at all. They're completely protocol agnostic. In fact, they're mostly representation agnostic. The idea is to not even to try to <clears throat> pardon me to try to not even nail down enums to a specific set of representations, but allow some some late binding and overriding uh, even even on those. 
So um, SDF is not really in the business of creating protocol bindings or describing any instances of things, but, but more <clears throat> toward describing common definitions for broad classes of things at the application level, like switches and on-off controls. So thing description basically uh, describes instances of things using the same descriptive ontology of actions, properties, and events. And it, it then has these protocol bindings. It has a specific enum. It has a form that points to a, a network address where you can go, go do this. And basically, um, the, we're using the default operations here, but with the form, you could tell it to use put instead of post or patch. You could do a lot of different things with the, the form. So basically, the thing description it adds the, the, the bound protocols and bound representations. Now, the, um, what we wanted to, like, I guess I should stop there and sort of see if there are any questions or, or comments before we get on to the, uh, the, the real topic, which is templates. Okay. to work from the GitHub issue. Sebastian asked me to just work work from this. Um, I think there's been some introduction of thing description templates and then um, those folks in in the, the lot working group please uh, please um, help me out here. <laughs> but basically a thing description uh, so thing descriptions themselves have a lot of requirements and constraints and they have uh, uh, they require uh, they're required to be complete. And what we what we realize is that we we <clears throat> very often have a lot of reasons to um, to make instances of thing description uh, like entities that aren't complete thing descriptions. They um, um, probably the, the one of the use cases is to have a thing description template that is a thing description but doesn't have the web address. It might have a, a partial protocol binding. It might have the data schemas, but it might not have the forms, or it might have the data schemas and the forms, but not the uh, but not the href part. And the idea is that you can build these templates as um, building blocks for thing descriptions, essentially, and, and you know, really a number of different ways that you might use them in the workflow. But this is really what we're uh, what we're working on is trying to figure out what what these look like. And so we thought, well, what would first thing description templates and one data model SDF definitions have some some common attributes, um, but some differences as well. So, you know, the one thing I say about one data model definitions is that they provide stable URIs for all of the things that are defined. So they're they're basically a vocabulary reference, uh, if you will, and, a, and, and somewhat an ontology reference. Um, they have simple relations like things have objects and objects have events, actions, and properties. and more like has a relation where thing descriptions are more like directly describes the affordances and has a little more um, semantics through through RDF. But but essentially the classes still line up actions, events, properties. So um, these are what we started off with and looking at as one of the one of the <clears throat> working working threads or work streams in these uh, designing templates was looking at how one DM uh, 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 SDF instances, if you will, and thing description template instances might might work together or might do, can we use thing description templates to create definitions the way we do with one data model or do we use them in some other way? So what are the use cases and how do they map and overlap? So um, here's what, what we sort of looked at is <clears throat> how would we use these uh, and I think this is a very similar kind of description. So we, we basically thought, well, um, yeah, this is really the same idea that I just showed. So um, this is not an instrumented um, 
TV though, this is basically to say, well, what could we do if we translated the one data model to a uh, to a thing description template? So we basically say there are actions on and off actions, there's state. And um, this is essentially an enum definition here. It's an interesting way of um, defining an enum and JSON schema, but um, it's essentially produces the same constraint that saying enum on off does. But um, this was sort of automatically translated through, a, through an algorithm. So instead of um, just translating it directly as an enum, it went into, and let me just show you the source file again. It went into this uh, enum definition and, and actually pulled out the constraints as they're expressed here. And so you see, uh, Rather than just have uh, have it defined as enum on off constraint like that, the uh, translation that Sebastian produced um, unwrapped or mapped it one to one, if you will, from the source definition. But other than that, it's the same as saying enum. So basically, this is a translation of of the definition as opposed to a um, an annotation of the of a TD with the terms in one data model. Michael, can you take questions now? Yeah. Michael? Um, hi, Michael Costa. Michael Evely. <laughs> just, a, just a very simple question. So here we define a mapping, but does anybody know that the string constant on actually has the semantics of switching something on? Is that part of SDF, or how is this information conveyed? Well, that's so. That's a good. That's an interesting question. Um, when you when you say how does it actually convey the semantics of that? What what would you know, there there are basically a lot of layers to that, right? So the SDF definition. So um, currently SDF is in development. So this construct you see SDF enum is not officially part of the language. It's one of the extension points that we're working on in order to allow SDF to do what you, uh, what you just asked about. And that is to, rather than just saying, here's an enum that's on off. In other words, you know, enum on off like this. And this is really how we could say this in SDF as well today without the SDF enum. But SDF enum is meant to provide a URI reference for each term in the enum, for each choice the enum offers, and then allow it to have its own set of descriptors and constraints. So currently, um, what we've done in, the, in this example is only provided a, a default. Well, this should actually probably say default and not constant because you should be able to override it. But you know, you might want to do it the other way also and fix it. But currently, for semantic um, depth, we're only really providing a human readable description that says the on state and the off state. Now, you could expand that and have more human readable description. But um, w when you start getting into machine readable descriptions, of, of uh, there are a lot of different ways you could go. And one of the ways that we're looking at is, well, how could we add a state machine language to describe on and off as, as two different states? That would get a little closer to talking about what's supposed to happen, but it still doesn't really say what on and off mean. In fact, that, that may even acquire special meaning according to the device of the on-off switch. You know, on-off switch here, the definition is meant to be reusable across a wide range of devices. So exactly what is meant by on and off state is probably different for each device. So um, I guess that's a long answer, but uh, I, I think it's a really interesting topic. And, and um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, on what would be relevant for you and say a digital twin environment for a description of them. well how could we extend this model to help semantically make digital twin models uh e easier to build right i think that would be one one good question we have so, one more michael who wants to weigh in michael cool <laughs> yeah so i think at some point the semantics is the link or, or the url that points to a particular definition in sdf and it's kind of the human's understanding of what that definition means. So we all looked at those and we all made an agreement about what it means. Yeah, that's, right. that's so true. it's a consensus. Yeah. And so 
that said, we still need to have precise definitions of you know what each of these states means in a human readable format. So, for example, does on mean the switch is closed, uh, uh, or open, or, or whatever, right? Well, again, for a device like for an electrical switch, like a knife switch, on does mean that the switch is closed. Yeah, yeah, but you can have negative logic too. So, I, I guess the point is that you could even have other devices where on might be that some mode is enabled. Right, right. So, I think, I think it's an example, and I think there's we need to be have precise definitions. But I think at the end of the day. The, the the link, uh, a persistent link to a, a given definition is in fact the semantics once we all have a, a consensual agreement mm -hmm. on what that label means. And then we use the at type to like refer to it. The point that uh, the example that Michael is showing uh, is illustrating if we omit the description and if we give this to somebody who does not speak English, it does not have any meaning. It has a constant, it has two strings which uh, consists of two or three characters, but it does not convey any kind of behavior in terms of turning something on or off or, yeah. Right. Well, I think what it boils down to is what is the grounding? What is the final definition that everything is built upon? And I think in this case is in fact the English description. So right. I, I have some examples that I'm not showing here because they're more verbose, but but they point to Wikipedia definitions of things, for example. Um, you know, why not, right? And then you can go say, oh, on and off. Well, those, you can look up them up on Wikipedia and you can, the other thing that we do um, just briefly with smart thing and smart things, we don't really need machine readable semantics, but we need human readable semantics across the globe. So we need good systems for internationalization. And a system like this of enums allows you to put in labels that can be internationalized through some standard um, directory systems, for example. And, and, and that tends to work out um, pretty good for, for, for that case. And then maybe there are some machine readable directories that could be useful um, from, from IEEE 61499 or systems like that also, right? So I think we, we are falling back a little bit uh, behind what we already had established, uh, which is that we do need those vocabularies. So on and off may be trivial for you, uh, but if you are talking about cheese farmers, which is our standard example for that, uh, the, the various grades of cheese firmness are not going to familiar uh, to, to, to a lot of people. A lot of people. So um, you want to uh, be able to have a source for the definitions of cheese firmness. And the same thing is uh, true for on and off and all the other things as well. So we need those semantic references uh, at some point. Uh, the, the language doesn't currently provide that. So SDF 1.0 doesn't even have the, the SDF enum uh, in it that, that uh, Michael uh, used here. So th that's uh, kind of the next uh, step. So we have two people in, in the list, uh, Kaz and, and Michael. Michael McCool. So Kaz, do you want to talk next? So, yeah, this... Uh, uh, pro yeah, th thank you very much for the Michael Costa. So this SDF approach is very interesting. On the other hand, uh, yeah, I was wondering uh, whether it would be really appropriate and uh, nice or easier to use uh, this JSON-based format to handle state transition in general. So for example, double switch actually has the standard for state transition control itself. And uh, 10 years ago, yeah. And also there was a payload data model named uh, Emma as well. So this kind of combination might be easier to handle the combination of step transition itself and the data model itself. So that's why I personally think uh, it might be um, easier to handle the whole mechanism if we combine think this kind of data model and the uh, genuine that transition mechanism, it's, yeah, separately. Cool. Uh, 
Yeah, and actually, I have kind of meta a meta question. So putting aside the issue of how do we define semantics formally, which is a very, very deep hole, I'd like to talk about just the process for how we kind of make progress here. So we have the what thing description that supports descriptions of device instances. We have uh, SDF, which supports, you know, uh, high level descriptions of semantics of devices. So uh, what is our, our path forward for our formal relationship? I think we have several different ways in which they can be used together. Um, I think we have a bunch of examples. Um, I think, you know, maybe we need to talk about, you know, if we were going to formally cite SDF inside, say, the new TD spec, um, what role would we put, put it into and, and what would we recommend people to do? And also, uh, a side of this is also uh, certain features in SDF that don't have a corresponding aspect in TDs, like, for example, SDF objects that we probably need to, to figure out how to do the mapping of. So can we address the, the process uh, issue? How do we make progress here? Yeah, okay, so let's um, let's get back to the GitHub issue because we've got we've got a few we 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 sort of move in that direction, right? So um, that's what we've done. Let's see, there are some ideas of using using links to link to concepts and how do we actually do that? I think there was some discussion. Maybe not. Okay, sorry, it's not here after all. So, um, I, and I had a slide. There was some discussion about workflow and how this is actually, you know, in in the workflow. And and clearly, it makes sense to use these definitions as annotation in a TD. And we should probably just bring that into the plug fest because uh, I pointed to these in the playground. They exist. Anyone can use them. They're relatively stable, so if we want to use these definitions in PlugFest from a motion sensor definitions or whatever, I think we could do that. We could do that tomorrow, right? Exactly. I mean, literally tomorrow, because they're, they're all there and they're all defined. <clears throat> and there's plenty. There's plenty there. There's like I don't looks like a couple hundred of them. Um, I think the bigger question is around the new spec and templates and how we construct templates and what the relationship of, of SDF to templates are. Now, SDF is basically a track that uh, the device, the device uh, specifiers and makers for the most part, and, and also a lot of folks who, who want to just engage developer tools to write down their definitions in JSON. And so what, what we've done is provided a real simple, you know, just to give you an idea of where we think SDF is going in the DM. There's this organization SunSpec that makes uh, solar energy, residential solar energy models that, that are used in controllers and in energy accounting and things like that, but not exactly like what's in Zigbee energy, but it's kind of similar to that. Um, also just Zigbee energy, the folks that work in Zigbee energy are really interested in having these bigger, broader models to, to work with and not just be constrained with the device models that, that are you know literally for constrained devices. So um, there are going to be a lot of things that are semantically defined, but um, there's no real obvious way to use them. There's no protocol binding. So SunSpec will have their, their sort of way of using whatever they have, RMI system they, they're using or whatever. Google Weave will have to convert them to protobuf files to use them in Weave, things like that, right? So. Uh, basically, there's some conversion. I think what we could do is make thing description really easy to use. Um, and, and I think the question is how these templates work. And I, the, the main question we're revolving on around right now, I think, is whether we translate, and I think this is true of IoT schema as well, the same question, whether we take these 1DM definitions in JSON and translate them to thing description templates and provide anchor URIs in the thing description namespace. Or we make templates that still link back to the 1DM models. And, and that's, I think there are some advantages and disadvantages of doing both. What's possible though, I think is, and, and I think the easiest way to reuse them, so we have to think about what happens when a 1DM model changes. 
we're going to rely on those as source data, we probably don't want to just copy them forward. We probably want to link to them so that we can uh, um, easily expand the, the definition. So what I what I expect or what I would propose we, we look at is when we create a theme description template, point to the one DM space that you're representing if you know, as, as if you really want to reuse the one DM definition and then add the semantics in the TD template that are needed to, to get it closer to it. So that um, by that, I mean, add the payload definition if you want additional constraints, um, select which definitions are actually present in the instance. So if I'm making a TD template, I could see this being useful as a device manufacturer. If I wanted to organize my device builders, I would use TD templates that are anchored in 1DM concepts so that they're interoperable with other devices. But but those those TD templates then would have my protocol bindings. So they would have the profile. If I was going to use the Watt profile, those TD templates would be Watt profile. So, so I guess I guess right, to summarize, so one way is right to have a bunch of different templates that are tailored to different implementations of the different basic models, basically. So I guess one thing we should do then is when we define T templates, do it with an eye towards interoperability with SD, SD, uh, one data model. Um, and so, for example, if we have a modularity construct in T templates, we should figure out that maps onto objects in. Uh, uh, SDA. Yeah, yeah. So the current discussion is that you can make a TD template for an object. And then you can figure out how to combine those templates in your device design according to your own way of making your device TDs. But that's still maybe there should be a web profile standard way of what profile standard way of doing that. Right. So I think there's a set of activities around specification alignment. I think there's another set of activities around examples and you know best practices and 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 kind of more informative things, which could go in an appendix in the spec. I think is a third class of activities, which is tooling, right? Which is if there's an automatic way to do things, people are more likely to use it. Um, so is there a way we can automatically generate T templates that map to OD SDF files or, or, or whatever? Um, and, and if that can be run kind of as a CI activity so that there's always an up-to-date set of templates available for every uh, current SDF uh, definition, that would be kind of very cool. Well, this might inform our some of the questions about what level templates operate at, and I think the answer is all of them in a way because you could I could see there being a base TD template that has no more information than an SDF file, maybe even less, but typically no more. In other words, it doesn't add any constraints. It doesn't. It just translates it to TD, and and gives it a context and uh, brings it into the linked data world. Then, you know, on that, on that, I could say, well, now I have a way of building it for co-op, right? Or a way of building it for HTML or MQTT or smart things or whatever. And I could see that as being a really useful. And then that could be driven through through CI. And this is really what I was encouraging us to do in the template uh, design, you know, uh, uh, whatever, the, the, <laughs> the, the template design work is to think about the workflows and think about where people are going to need to use templates and what, you know, sort of like, I can really think of the main use case being, I want templates to be building blocks so I can easily create whole TDs and manage the modularity of products and services. But there could be other use cases, but that, I think that's the one that, that I'm proposing to start with. So Michael Lagerly? Yeah. Um... So maybe just a very high level and generic question. I understand there is a set of uh, defined um, well building blocks in a way in terms of SDF in, uh, in these examples. Um, and I think I understand I can compose them and build some kind of aggregates of these objects. Um, I'm, I, if I, if I just look into the capabilities of a TD and into the expressiveness of SDF, can I express things with SDF that I cannot express in a TD or vice versa? Can I express things in a TD that I cannot express in SDF or is there a one-to-one -one mapping possible? Uh, and and what, I think what you just said is, is really key. 
You can express things in SDF that we have not provided in TD, uh, such as like the full set of constraints. Um, but there aren't, there aren't that many because SDF is meant to be just a defining of the basic classes for things. But um, there are some things we have in SDF that aren't in TD that have to do with what we call qualities. And there are some mainly in SDF, there are compositional things and modularity features that aren't in TD. As, as McCool was getting out earlier, there's this, uh, this layering of SDF object and SDF thing where you can define even reusable things as components for more complex things. And that doesn't exist in TD. Mm -hmm. So that's actually, um, but TD only describes instances, so maybe that's, that's you know, as we said, well, that's kind of up to how you build instances. We don't have a standard way to do that. It's a punt, because really, there, when you try to do it, there are some issues, and you would like to have the, uh, the modular semantics as well. You'd like to know that your light bulb has on-off color control and dimming and energy measurement. You'd especially like to know that it has energy measurement, so you can put it into the things that you can measure energy on, for example. Um, so the, but so, I think it's worth mentioning that there are a lot of things that you can do in a 2D that, that are not in SDF. So for instance, that's we, where I was going to go next. Thank you. Go ahead. We don't have protocol bindings uh, and so on. So one of the points about the SDF effort is to make it really easy to map the existing data models into SDF and preferably back. And um, so the, the focus really has been here has been on model interoperability. And th that's a very different focus from the one that, that TD uh, had. Uh, and I think that that's why the, the results look so different. Uh, but of course, the next step is to, to make sure that, that we have model interoperability at that level as well. So right now, oh, when you about see, network interoperability. Sorry, oh, sorry <laughs> just just a question on that one, uh, Karsten, When you say existing data models, uh, you refer to OCF models or to something else in addition, or OCF, something be Bluetooth, whatever you have out there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Each of these organizations has has a hundred or a couple hundred uh, data models already. And uh, what we are trying to do is uh, find a way to, to uh, translate all these data models into a common language and, and back. And th that, of course, creates some, some uh, the need for some compromises on expressibility. So we, we are not in the business of extending SDF uh, a lot just because uh, there is that one model over there we cannot map. Uh, we are currently more in the, the process of making sure we can access all those ecosystems uh, first. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes it clear. Thank you. And, you know, we have even uh, got to the point of some of those ecosystem folks looking at SDF and looking what other folks have contributed and kind of thinking about extending the ecosystem. So that, that might be the pace at which SDF common evolves, even though we have extension points that we can use to get out ahead of things a little bit too. <clears throat> um, I think we covered most of the things with templates, like where we are and, you know, we have an example of what a template looks like that corresponds to an SDF definition and we have some kind of framing for the discussion going forward. So, um, I don't have any more uh, points to make. Is there any more questions or discussion? Uh, yeah, yeah. At the end of our slot. <laughs> so, uh, that, that's it. We're exactly at the time when the slot was supposed to end. Um, so I think uh, one question was, what, what is the way forward? Uh, and um, I think there is going to be a lot of discussion uh, of this in, in the next uh, few uh, uh, wishy calls. So that, that's maybe the best place uh, for people who are really interested in, in making these uh, various approaches uh, work together uh, can, can go to. And uh, so right now we have SDF 1.0, which was published on last Friday. And um, the next step, of course, will be to, to do an SDF 1.1 and not, not, not uh, drop in the kitchen sink, but really put in those features uh, we need to, to widen the scope 
even more things, uh, Bluetooth, uh, Zigbee, um, uh, and so on. And um, I'm sure we will discuss these things in the uh, Wishy calls over time. And we uh, can start working with this in the Watt plug test immediately. Yes. We also have a semantic proxy project that we're going to be working in the Watt, Watt plug, plug test that I need to document and, and enter. <laughs> so um, yeah, stay tuned. In that case, let's follow up in the Watt plug test. And Michael, you will be at that, the Watt plug test? Uh, well, as much as I can, as much as I can do with this semantic proxy that we're working on. So let's follow up there then for next and then in the next wishy call on the 30th. Yeah, the semantic proxy uses node watt and it actually uses um, uh, whatever Ege is calling his thing. I forget. Um, it's um, 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 anyway, it's virtual thing. Yeah, it uses virtual thing. And Michael, a uh, question about the proc fest. Um, are also non Web of Things members? Are they able to join one way or the other, the Web of Things block fest? Uh, yes. And I mean, technically we could invite you, but if you're interested in joining the Watt plug fest, um, give me a ring and I will forward you the WebEx so you can come in. And I would say it's an open invitation uh, to people who are interested in working on IoT stuff. The, the WebEx is not public just because we avoid spammers. So just email me and I can email you the WebEx. Kaz is asking whether we are talking about the plug fest next week, and the answer, I think, is yes. Uh, yes, and there's also the same wiki page as used for the, uh, the workshop originally is uh, also used for the plug fest, so you can link back to that from the agenda page if you wish. A few minutes. Great. So I think it, it's good that we we have generated this this visibility. Mutual visibility here, and uh, we, we need to pick up these uh, communication channels to, to make sure what we are doing is eventually converging. Uh, so, th this is just one step, and we will need a few more steps to get there. The, the last item on the agenda is uh, hypermedia controls in thing descriptions. Uh, and uh, Engel Kauken has uh, pointers to do to to uh, W3C what uh, proposals on on doing that. So Engel, do you want to go ahead and talk about those? Can you share your screen. Sure. <clears throat> do you hear me? Yes. Okay. So do you see my screen with the GitHub? It's pretty small. So if you oh. maybe can help us a few times. That is, that is difficult, but I can do maybe this. Did it change anything? OK. Yes, so uh, hello everyone. Uh, I um, I wanted to introduce the hypermedia um, uh, proposals that we have in the thing description repository. Um, so uh, the, these proposals are in this proposals folder and there are two of them. So hypermedia control and hypermedia control two. Um, so the first one is proposed by Victor Sharpenai and the second one is proposed by me. Um, since the second one is based on the use case of the first one, I will start with the first one. I will also just quickly check if Victor is here. Um, yes, he is here. OK. Um, yes, so I'll start with the first one. Okay, Victor is yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I'll, since we have time, I will start with explaining the whole um, idea. 
And uh, basically, until now, in team descriptions, we we had actions that were uh, so th we are focusing mostly on actions, but maybe it could be applied to other interaction affordances. But basically, until now, in team descriptions, we had actions that would be started uh, by the client or the consumer, and uh, but we would not do anything more on the uh, actions. So basically, they would be started. Maybe the, the response would return something. Maybe nothing. So in case we are fading a light, it would fade and we wouldn't be able to know anything more about the ongoing operation. And since there's already um, some um, sort of um, existing implementations regarding hypermedia, we, um, such as the Mozilla implementation and the Oracle um, device um, cloud, we want to be able to describe the hypermedia use cases in thing descriptions. So the so the first one so the example that the bot proposals use is a, is a light that uh, fades uh, to a certain value or for a certain amount of time when the client invokes it. So we can assume that this takes like a, a long time, let's say more than a couple seconds. Um, yeah. So we say that we you can post to this fade URI. Um, uh, which will start the action, uh, as you can see below. And then we can do a GET request uh, to sort of a query and like know the status of the action and the thing responds to us. And then we can uh, change the action while it's still ongoing uh, or while it's pending to another value so that in case we want to do fade for two seconds, we can now fade for five seconds, or we can actually stop the action, ongoing action. So it's important to note that there is the, the slash one at the end of the URI, which is uh, reflected at this ID field at the end of the, the URIs. So this one is generated by the thing. Exactly, so as it is stated, the, the first request is very much possible in the current standard, but the, the, the subsequent requests on the created resource are, are not um, is easily describable. Yeah, so in the usual case, we would have something, a thing description like this. So we have an action that fades, that takes an number uh, duration in milliseconds and this is understandable uh, completely by a, with a current thing, with the current uh, consumer of this thing. Okay, um, exactly. So as we know, hypermedia in general uh, means that we can uh, expect that the thing indicates to the consumer what can it do later on with the created resources. So in this case is that if the thing answers with 201, uh, fade one, um, we can do some further operations on this fade one. Um, and in our case, the further operations that we can do is such as get, put, and delete, um, and what they would actually do to the action. So what it means is like what it, what these methods, which are protocol specific, would imply, so that it would update, cancel, uh, for example, the action. Exactly. So, um, with the, quite simply, the the idea is to um, to learn about the f the so once the post operation is done, to learn about the upcoming or the subsequent operations. So, um, um, the the argument that also differs the two proposals is that uh, here we want to um, not explain in this case uh, all the possible interactions in a certain sequence or not um, in the thing description since it will uh, uh, so overload the TD um, and the the more concrete uh, difference is that this proposal allows for piecewise consumption of TDs or where where we 
can have TDs that change over time based on the um, based on the um, on the state the of the thing. Exactly. Uh, I see there is a question already. Yes, uh, Michael. Oh, just some comments. So there are straight two issues that you know, use cases. So one is, um, do you have all the information up front as a developer to understand the API completely for a thing? So that's that's one issue. How do I get a complete description of all possible interactions that my, my code might have to deal with? The other is RTD static or dynamic. I just want to point out the dynamic TDs have all kinds of complications with uh, registry and directories signing uh, identifiers etc um so in this concrete proposal it's it's dynamic tds right i'm just saying there's going to be complications and trade-offs um yes. versus when we have dynamic uh and incremental versus static and complete mm -hmm. uh yes i will come to the to the differences between the two proposals there's also a nice comment from daniel uh that uh highlights some of the differences we have Okay. To see if I uh, I can continue if you want. Sure. About this proposal, uh, so far there was activity in my office. Sorry for that. I couldn't really talk. Um, so the essential idea of uh, the, the the proposal is to reuse the hypermedia uh, vocabulary that is defined as a module of the thing description model. So um, for every new affordance the thing provides, there would be a new form somewhere in the thing description. And we, we wouldn't need to, to add much to the, to the thing description model to allow for this. We would only need to create new operation types. Currently, there is no operation type for um, the cancellation of, a, of an action or the update of an action. Um, and these operation, operation times um, would be needed. Uh, should I scroll down, by the way? You can tell me, or should, do you want to share your screen? Uh, it's fine, I was, um, I, I was more or less done. This was the general idea. And then there were different um, possibilities as to uh, how to expose these new forms. Um, right, and you can um, go on with your proposal more specifically. Okay. Um, yes, so as um, Victor mentioned, these, uh, these, these form uh, forms can be appended to the forms array of the thing uh, once the this resource is created. So um, the consumer could reconsume the thing, um, so like this basically. So if we get a thing description, we do a post request, and then we once we know that it it results in the creation of a resource, we get the thing description back, and then learn what is possible. Um, so the, this is the, this part, um, is an extension, uh, from my point of view, the, the, the different regarding different versions of the thing description as well. So, um, I go on to this new operation types that Victor mentioned. Um, so the proposal includes read action, update action and cancel action. Um, that are then mapped to the get put post in the case of HTTP, um, where the, they appear in these newly created forms. Um, and additionally, um, in the current case, the invoke action operation uh, has the input and output fields uh, that corresponds to its payload. And here we can also have such um, uh, terms in the action level that correspond to the payload of the update or cancellation. So 
here, uh, like usual, the input is what we use to invoke the action. And here you can see the out is update, um, which also takes a number. And then these are then mapped to the forms uh, here, where you also see the new operation types. And this TD is also what is created once the fade one resource is created. Yes. Um, yes, so the, the, this is mostly it. Um, um, the, it's also important to note that the output isn't the uh, data, the sort of payload uh, of the response of the initial post request, but it is the representation of the action, so the, the the result of the read uh, action. Yes, yeah, so uh, there is some more uh, material in this regarding event and some other uh, aspects, but I think we can skip them for, for today. Or, um, yeah, so if this is, uh, if you think that's all about this proposal, I'll go to the next one, Victor. Yes, sure. Go on. Okay. Um, okay, so this is the second proposal. Um, very, very similarly, we have the new operation types. We have the new fields. Um, I just called it query action instead of read action in, the, in this way. Um, and what is different is that for each of these terms that are on the action level, so not the operation types, they also have input and output fields. And uh, this is again like the the previous case, the, this is the fade operation. And again, a simple thing description that is uh, the respecting the current standard. Um, exactly. So the, the hypermedia use case is uh, similarly, uh, it's exactly the same as what Victor has proposed. Um, uh, it's just that I also thought of having static IDs. So in case we cannot do pending uh, actions, we can just reject an action if we don't, we cannot start it at the moment. So we wouldn't maybe need uh, dynamic IDs. Um, so here is then the, the possible um, request that could be made. So it's just without the responses because I think that is what gets it complicated. Um, exactly. So uh, as, as Victor said, we cannot know what, what to do with, how to do the subsequent operations. So the get, put, and delete. Um, however, basically in this case, uh, we have the, um, the, all the, operations and the forms that are statically put into the thing description. And uh, as you can see, the we can have a variable ID or um, or sort of dynamic href, or it could be static. Yes, so basically with this, uh, like, like the case of Victor, we solve how to do the subsequent operations. Um, but of course, the consumer has to know that invoke action should be what is done the first. So um, in contrast to Victor's proposal, uh, in the Victor's case, only invoke action can be done uh, in the beginning. Then, then it's very clear what the thing should do first. Whereas in this case, the thing has to know that invoke action has to be the first thing that needs to be done um, with, with the thing. That these are indeed subsequent operations. The, the other tree. Yes, so in this case, the ID is not uh, clear how to get the ID. Um, we can ignore it if the case, if the ID is always static. Um, also at the same time, it is not clear how the request payload um, or the response payload for different uh, operations should be. And the, the takeaway from this is to uh, 
is that in case the href of different forms are dynamic, we need to we need a way to describe how this is retrieved, and we will need to be able to better express the different requests and response payloads of a, of an action. So I start with the second one and then go to the first one. But very simply, um, here I I add the these three different terms. So query action, so query update and cancel on the action level that all have input and output fields. So if we think of a sort of a tree, um, we'd always, let's say, have the title. And then in the actions for the fade, we have the usual input and output. But then we can have these other fields, which all have, again, input and output. So these are on the same level as the, so they're on the action level. And uh, so similar to the evoke action, so if the cancel member isn't present, that means that the cancel action doesn't expect the payload or similarly. So if one is not present, uh, it, does, it just means that there is no payload associated. Thus, in this case, the payload would look like the following. Sorry, the, the TD would look like the following, where we have the query, which gives uh, an, uh, a payload when, at, at the response. That includes the brightness value, the current brightness, and then it can also tell the status uh, of the action. Um, and then we can have, like, as usual, the update and so on. And this hasn't changed from the previous one. So the, um, the these have either dynamic IDs or static ones. So we will go into this now. Oh, wait, there are actually three questions. Maybe I can uh, take the questions first. Or should I finish? Um, well, I think uh, <clears throat> my question is related to what you're talking about. Um, now, you're talking about the first proposal or the second one? This is the, the second Sec one. Second, right? yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to address uh, the issue of URI templates. So one of the things you've done here is you've put in the um, different options down under forms under action. And if you can just scroll up on this example, please. So you mean the payloads? Yeah, so these all share, you know, um, you know, uh, the, the same thing on action. So to me, the logical thing to do would be to have for each different thing I can do with an action, you know, create, cancel, uh, request status, etc. I should have input and output data schemas for those interactions. Yes. And it seems to be the logical thing to do is to be able to define if I use the same name for an element of a data schema, then it actually corresponds to the same entity. So for example, if I create an action and I get back a result that I label as an ID, then I later on have a URI template where I define an ID to be used in that URI template. I think we could simply say those are the same thing so that the system understands that that data is to be carried forward from the response back into the to the other interaction. However, I think the structure here isn't quite right because we have, you know, a data schema and then we have a bunch of forms and we actually need data schemas per transaction, I think, because it can be different. So I don't think that's quite captured by the structure. Sorry, I didn't understand data schema per interact per transaction. So you have these forms, right? Um, and these different, you know, cancel or whatever. But in yeah. fact, the payloads can be different for those different interactions, right? Exactly. So, so the, for example, the query action operation has this as the. Okay, so you actually the, identify the data schema support. Okay, so I think we simply add the rule here that if a, a, a given name for a, a data schema element is reused, that they are inter be interpreted as being the same thing. I'll just have a rule that's just carry data, you know, from response back to a, a further interaction. Ah, I see. So if I if I say ID, for example, in the URI template later on, and I have ID as a response from my post, I should be able. I will to I will come to this actually. Yeah, this is a specific okay. case. I will come to this uh, point. Okay, great. We have about four minutes left. Two people in the queue. Okay, uh, maybe then I then I finish this such that then maybe uh, we have all the questions ready. Um, sorry, so Zoltan and Victor, I'll just finish this quickly. 
Um, okay, then, so about the dynamic HFs, by the way, uh, so as Klaus had pointed out on Friday, we could have the entire HF as a variable. So it could be that there's only the, the ID in the href. Okay, um, then for the case of HTTP, um, so how can we explain and construct the dynamic HREFs? So as the HTTP standard and like Mozilla Web Network tells is that in the in the status code of 201, so in the response that has 201 in the status code, um, um, it can actually be that the, um, this location is supplied in the header of the response, or it could be in the body of the response. So in case it is in the header, uh, then we would have to have a form like this, where uh, we say that the headers are like this, uh, where the location, so it's it's always called the location uh, per, by the standard. And then this ID should be then remapped back to the forms that we had shown before. And the consumer should understand that this is the headers of the response and not the request that it has to supply, for example. Um, but location is, I think, always in the response. Um, and then if it is in the body of the response, then we would have to have a TD where we have the input again, but then the response of this first post operation has an, let's say, a key called H href, and then this is linked back to ID. I am not super satisfied with this way, but I am up for proposals on how this could be done. Um, Yes, and then basically the rest is as before. Yes. Um, yeah, so I have some observation regarding Spring API, but I think we can skip it for now. Um, and I also have an example, but I think we have not enough time to, for all this. So let's get the questions. So the next one was uh, Zoltan. Okay. Yeah, I wanted to ask that, um, so it looks like uh, you have three standard actions associated to an action. And uh, in, in some cases, I would probably would prefer to configure some events for the updates and uh, an action for the canceling, which leads to the question that um, if it would return uh, something like a thing, it would be easier to model with properties, actions and events what is possible to do on that interaction. So I understand we don't want to use things for abstract uh, things, but um, we could call it something and then it would be valid in the context of that interaction. So has has that been explored? So like a, specific, like a separate property interaction affordance uh, under properties that is like, let's say, can be observed so that you get like the update back for the event? Yeah, depending on the use case, an event would be more efficient probably than calling an action repeatedly yeah. over the network. I think that would be also like, uh, this is something I didn't consider. Uh, maybe we can also be able to describe this in some way. Um, I just also don't know if this is an, an existing uh, approach like in the hypermedia circles. But I didn't think of it yet. Uh, that's a good point. Victor? Um, a question about the very last thing you said about the ID in curly brackets. Where do uh, you, you... This one? Yes, here. Um, that, that requires to have a URI variables field as well, right? Um, and, and I mean, in the thing description there, you should define what this uh, URI variable refers to this is a good point however um, I think the URI variables are more the URI like not for URI templating but it's actually the data you send in the URI but uh, after the after the resource with the, the question mark like the query parameters so to say or or can this be also used for this I don't know Um, here, the the ID may not be a URI. 
Exactly. It, yeah, can, that's right. it, it can be the input of some further action to invoke. So, so you mean like uh, well, question mark Q equals like ID equals something after the href? Yes. In any case, you have to say that this ID is is a control. It's um, it's part of a, a form to mm -hmm. to to perform more actions. Yes. So this has to be somehow linked back. And this is the part that I'm not super satisfied with, like linking this information that comes in the href of the payload to to a form. OK. And by the way, there was the uh, proposal to use OpenAPI, because what you are suggesting is really a rewriting of OpenAPI. Um, but OpenAPI doesn't. Uh, solve this problem either. Uh -huh. So this is a really open question um, for hypermedia controls in general. <laughs> okay, I think that that's an interesting discussion because uh, um, we are running in, into the, the problem that uh, even the established mechanisms like open API cannot really do what we are trying to, to do. Uh, yeah. So we have to do some, some new design work and uh, I'd, I'd love to to uh, propose how to do this in SDF. It's rather obvious, but we don't have time uh, today. So let's continue this this discussion in the next Rishi Uh Another way to discuss this is there's an API specification conference coming up, which will actually involve um, Open API as well as others, and we're contemplating doing a, a submission to that. This might be a really interesting topic to bring up in that community. Um, and I think it'd be interesting also if the Wishy people uh, also participated. So I bring it up earlier, but I think it'd be interesting to look at this uh, at this conference as a, as a venue for discussion with a wider group. Who is we? The Web of Things. We've been discussing this in the main call. We oh, to participate okay. in the okay. API specification conference. Um, we have an issue discussing that right now. And actually, I noticed Egge posted uh, posed abstract. I do think this topic of how to handle hypermedia controls is a very interesting one and is likely to be a subject of conversation at that conference, even if we don't bring it up. I have pasted the link of this issue. Yeah, great. Okay, so uh, thank you for contributing to this slot. Ari, do you want to do a quick wrap up? Well, yeah, it's going to be a very quick one. Again, there are four, four minutes over time, but Thank you, everyone, for very good discussions. And clearly, there's much more interesting work for all of us to be, be doing together. So as Karsten pointed out already, I think we can use the upcoming wishy calls uh, to take more focus step on, on the specific items that we have uh, discovered today. And we certainly need to uh, keep on going on, on this ongoing work on aligning thing description templates and thing description and, and one DMSDF. Uh, but I think the next wishy call is going to be a good venue for all of those. So looking forward to see as many of you as possible on, on the June 30th, um, which we should call. It's going to be most likely uh, on, a, on a later time than usual. So also people from US should be able, able to join it. But apologies for everyone in Asia for, for that particular instance. Uh, and I'll capture the URL for all I had in our, our wiki page as well. Perfect. Nice. Karsten, anything you want to say to wrap up? Yeah, I just wanted to to point the to the link with the agenda to the next uh, wishy call. We will certainly have some form of uh, thing to thing research group meeting again uh, in in the second half of uh, July, but uh, we are still trying to find out uh, the details uh, for that. So for now, uh, thank you all for. Uh, joining and uh, hopefully see you in in that uh, research group meeting. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.